Okay, okay members um, and community members, we can get started. We have a quorum. Um, I'll start by indicating that the Economic and Community Development Committee and the committee that comes after this, the Finance and Business Services Committee, um, are both public meetings and they'll be streamed live and uh, recorded for publishing on the internet. There's a camera up there. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of the meeting. Uh, that means that your presence at and all or any contribution that you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or public, uh, published publicly, <coughs> publicly by the Council including the transferring outside of Australia. So I declare the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting open and begin by acknowledging um, that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that we pay our respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We have um, no apologies and legal absence, although we have been advised that Councillor Antic is likely to arrive late, and obviously we've got a couple of other members who are also coming late. Um, I uh, ask for someone to um, confirmation the minutes. Can someone move the minutes? Moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Can I put that? All those in favour? That's carried. Mm. Members, with your leave, I'd like to um, bring item six, which is the items for adoption on block. Uh, up in up the agenda. Um, so can I have your leave to do that? Just so that we can, otherwise people are going to be waiting for some time um, because we've got five delegations we need to hear from and, and if there's matters that we're going to adopt on block then rather than have them wait for half an hour we can get that just done. You just asked on the item six for adoption on block, which items are you referring to? I'm, got, I'm going to do the call. I'm going to do the call. Yeah. Okay, so with your leave I will do that. So members, um, We'll need to call out item seven because we have a number of, um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, item eight, Smart Move Review 2016. Councillor Martin. Item nine, City Insights. Councillor Martin. Item 10, Exploring Centre for Food Culture. Sorry. Councillor Martin. Item 11, Works Compound Licence Consultation, New City High School. Councillor Hershaw. Item 12, Works Compound Licence Consultation, Torrens Junction Project. Item 13, Adding Value to the Nighttime Economy, Lord Mayor. Item 14, Out of Session Information Papers to Note. Uh, there's a notice of engagement and research activity, a notification regarding alteration of on-site parking controls. Councillor Martin. Um, that's it. So there's only one item that we can move um, on block, which is item 12. Would someone like to um, move item 12, Works Compound Licence Consultation Foreign Junction Project? Councillor Abiad, moved by Councillor Abiad, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Can I put that item, all those in favour? That item is carried. Thank you, members. That brings us to our deputations. So, our members, we've got five deputations tonight. They all relate to item seven, the bike waves project. Um, and I'm, um, I'll ask you to come forward. Those of you who are in the um, uh, in the audience, if your name is called, called, I wonder if you could just come forward and sit at the seat the opposite to me. And um, there's a button to press which says speak, and you'll be given five minutes to speak, and then members will ask you questions. So the first of our speakers tonight is, oh, we've got Trudy Clay, Thompson and Scott Sims. Welcome Faye, please come and have a seat. So we have five minutes, you will be timed, the dinger will go off. Please go ahead. Lord Mayor, Chair Councillors, I'm here as the Chair of the Bicycle Institute of South Australia to address you in regards to the bicycle, uh, so the bikeways route development and proposal for the existing section of the ground treatment uh, from bikeway treatment since. For those who don't know me, my name is Faye Patterson. I'm a traffic engineer who specialised in cycling for 20 years, including three as pedestrian and bike planning for the Council, 
And I once wrote a bike plan for ACC that proposed high quality, high quality separated north, south, east, west bike routes through the city. <laughs> so I'm personally very gratified that this council is acting on the suggestion. From the design concept, treatment six is proposed for the existing chrome bikeway. It features high curves on both sides of the two metre bike lane and would not allow cyclists to overtake as your agenda report notes. It could not therefore carry the bicycle traffic currently using the chrome bikeway, much less allow for any growth in bike use, as your agenda report also notes. This is a critical issue for anyone using the bikeway and for the Bicycle Institute. It should also be a critical issue for you because having bikes in the traffic lane and holding out cars because the bikeway is too narrow would reflect extremely badly on the council. However, this is not specifically why I'm here. In tonight's meeting, you will be asked to approve, approve a design concept to take to public consultation to be uh, followed by further development and then construction. But what about debate on the design concept itself? The concept shows that six is the only option for the existing chrome bike plan. <coughs> Your agenda report confirms that treatment six cannot cater to the current levels of cycling in Chrome Street. Um, rather than not this in the park lands, you might suggest this, uh, you might uh, check this by placing concrete wheel stops in one block of chrome bikeway in one direction to give a two metre uh, lane with curves on either side and then observe the results. However, the real decision facing council is not about treatment six. It's how to best use its budget to deliver north, south, east, west bike routes. There are several choices that could be made. A shared use path is shown from Barton Terrace to the new Adelaide High School site. The Parklands Trail already provides this access. So could this new park be admitted and the funds allocated to Chrome South Kiri? Would this make a difference in the treatment then possible? More broadly, would the community prioritise a higher quality treatment in Chrome Street over having such treatment at all in this case group? There is no obvious avenue in the consultation process to look at questions like this. So the results of consultation will give council no guidance about what trade-offs are acceptable to its constituents and no obvious way that the community can state its own key non-negotiables, such as the ability to overtake. Tonight, we recommend that you do not approve the concept design to go to consultation, but ask this to be amended so that treatment six is not the only or preferred option south of Peary Street and that the consultation process be amended to first develop design options with stakeholders, then see, seek feedback on these options. No one wants the next Chrome bikeway to have to be ripped up again. Please, let's make, we, make sure we get the process right. Thank you, Pat. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yes, I hope we can have a look at the, uh, the uh, samples. Actual scale models. Have you been able to see those? Uh, no, we weren't made aware of them oh, right. except through the papers. So, we don't have oh, right. okay. so the administration found the trouble actually with all these mock ups that yes. a number of us went and had a lot of cry about around everyone else. Children in school. But, um, the option one, I'm disappointed to hear that option six being flagged as the only option for south of the um, thing because those curved. The tank traps are, as it's asked, are problematic. If you go to a tank and hit one of those, so my question is, um, got treatment one, and if you see it there, that is all flush, has got paving between the sort of streets, which would enable the fire cyclists to overtake that spot. I mean, would you be more comfortable with that if we were to amend uh, to treatment six to treatment one, the flush option? Um, yes, but I mean you might consider treatments one to four, which is what you've got north of Perry Street. Mm. Um, treatment six is the one we have problems with. We know mm. there are possibilities. Treatment one because it's flush, pedestrians may not be so comfortable with. So <coughs> yeah, it's Thank you. Any other questions, members? No. Well, thank you very much for your for your presentation, and I'll now call on. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Bonham, who's um, also going to speak on this item. Welcome, Jennifer. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, I am a cycling researcher. I've been doing cycling research since the early 2000s, and my main focus of research is around the city. 
and we recently published the book Sparkling Futures through Elite University Press. So my concern with this topic um, is really if Front Street is going to serve as a template for a cycling infrastructure in the city, then uh, and if it's going to cater for the needs and abilities of all levels of bike riders, then I'm actually concerned that there's no obvious discussion about um, about the diversity of cycle users and whether or not the current infrastructure or the proposed infrastructure is actually going to cater to that uh, a greater diversity of users. Now we know um, in terms of Frome Street that uh, in terms of gender, it's got better gender balance than any other kind of infrastructure. We know anecdotally that it's got a diverse, greater diversity of users than other infrastructure. But we only know that through anecdotal evidence and observation. We haven't actually done or had any sort of study of that. So we know that parents use it with their children. We know that um, that it has a diversity of bikes on it, like cargo bikes, trikes, etc., etc. Um, but we we actually really we know that people use this and feel safer when they're using this route. But we know nothing about exactly why they feel safer. Is it because of the width of the green cycle path? Is it because it's actually got a hard uh, segregation? Or is it because of the park protected um, bike lane? So not just hard segregation, but also it's park protected. So if we take away that park protection during peak hour, then we're actually going to be putting cyclists much closer. We may still have some hard segregation, but we're going to be putting cyclists much closer to heavy traffic. Now, in my work with women pretending to cycling, uh, what I found was, okay, there's a number of women, and I'm sure this applies to many men as well, there's a number of women who are, who are nervous about cycling in traffic, and there's a number of women who actually feel quite harassed by cycling in close proximity to traffic. So it's not so much about for some women that they can't handle it, it's just that they find it harassing being very close to traffic. So actually reverting to two lanes of traffic has potentially, and we don't know the answer to this because the research hasn't been done, but it could potentially put um, women in that and those other users who are concerned about that in that more difficult position um, I'm also concerned that we're taking examples from overseas without actually thinking about the context in which we're putting them into. Uh, places like Copenhagen and the Netherlands, they actually require motorists, they've developed their infrastructure in a context where they require motorists to actually pass competencies, um, skills and theory testing and interacting with cyclists. You have a greater number of people who both cycle and drive, and um, uh, and my third point has just slipped off, <laughs> but there is another point there. So I'm really nervous about actually taking this example without really thinking closely about the users that we've got in the Australian context. Um, and personally, uh, in in the independent review of the cycleway, there isn't any evidence that we actually need four lanes of traffic on Frome Street. Um, it's a low volume um, street, and and from an engineering perspective, uh, traffic engineering perspective, uh, there appears to be no evidence for, for going back to that four lanes. So I am concerned with the proposals that are being put to the public um, for public consultation. First of all, I'm concerned that there's no real discussion with users about the implications in terms of uh, the, we have no research on the diversity of users and exactly what it is about our infrastructure that they find um, works for them or doesn't work for them. Um, and I'm concerned that in the consultation process, it doesn't appear that the existing design uh, is actually an option, keeping things as they are. And I would expect, I anticipate that in the consultation, there is also going to be um, an indication of how much it's going to cost, um, rate payers, et cetera, to actually revert uh, or replace this infrastructure. 
Councillor Martin, you have a question. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, just to clarify uh, the points that I think you're making, um, uh, and you have clearly uh, uh, the argument that you want to see the current circumstance as an option. Are you also endorsing as part of that the current width of the Frame Street Bikeway? That, that, that is essentially what you're saying. That infrastructure, current width, the current uh, facility is fine as it is. I, I think it is. I certainly we could beautify it. There's absolutely no question about that. And that will actually encourage users because I think most people around the table were at the Young Campbell's presentation um, a few weeks ago. And as we know, it's that beautification that actually is attractive both to local residents. Um, given the research done in Sydney by Melon Crane, um, it's attractive to residents as well as um, it encourages um, cyclists on that. So I am arguing at the very least to have the existing infrastructure as it stands um, as part of the consultation. And uh, a supplementary question then, if, if that would be your preference, on what do you base that preference? Basically because it allows um, easier overtaking, it is actually effectively two metres and five centimetres. I went out and measured it on the weekend. So as an effective bike lane, and I use that cycle lane um, a lot myself, and it has an effective width as it is of two metres. And that allows for comfortable overtaking. Now in my observations of parents shepherding children a longer bikeway, they also need that, that kind of width to comfortably shepherd children and to allow for overtaking cyclists. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a comfortable you know, width through, through those observations. Thank you. Could I just ask a clarifying question? And that is, when you say the effective width, in, as opposed to the actual width? Well, well, the, well, the actual width, if you, if you consider that um, 45 centimetres is taken up with gutter, and then if you want to avoid your pedal stride on the right hand side, then you've got to ride 27 minutes within it. And so you've got an effective bike lane of two metres and five centimetres. So the current proposals that are all looking to narrow the, to the bike lane itself to two metres, um, and I'm not sure, but I'm sure Faye will be able to address this more closely, is, is that taking into account um, the buffers? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Madam Councillor Wilkinson, you had a question? Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, are you aware that um, there's a number of the options put forward that the bike lane is uh, an angle of this, the concrete finish such that the four percent of the five hundred water table is not there so that car bicycles can actually ride close to the curb. So that's part of the feature of this so this proposal. But, but I've noticed that there's some of that propose you know a, a slightly lowered um, on, on some of your um, design, is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, so the proposals have a two metre continuous concrete. So as a cyclist, I know that could be an issue to be with the and then settled, but, but these are two metres complete. There's no in with the water table. So I just want to be aware of that design feature. I've looked through the proposals that you had on that oh, one. So I think what Council was is saying is there is no gutter. Yeah, but you've still got to yeah. provide separation yeah. with your pedestrians. So you might not have a gutter, but you still have to have some sort of oh, separation. Yeah, there's a curve, <laughs> but there's not a water table, that's what you can see. And that's a bitch and concrete water table. But, but, you, but you've still got to um, ride out from that so that you actually, uh, you don't strike it. If you've got a curve, you've got a cycle. And you should be talking to the engineer. Mm -hmm. okay. You, you know, you've actually got to make sure that you don't strike the curve. Any other questions for Dr. Bond? If not, thank you very much for your presentation and I'll call on our next speaker, Mr. Paul Johnston.
Um, Rose and I have uh, recently moved into uh, Adelaide from the country. Welcome. And our principle here is not to drive our car in the city. So we walk and we catch the connector bus and we cycle. And we love the Frome Road bikeway. It and the expectation that there will be more to follow is one of the major reasons why we moved here to Adelaide. Now we're not very confident on our bikes in city traffic and the width and the protection of the existing front road bikeway does encourage us to cycle. We do tend to look around a bit and stop and so we wobble a bit but at 2.7 metres the bikeway is wide enough to allow us for other cyclists, cargo bikes etc to um, pass us quite safely. We reckon that it offers a pretty reasonable balance. People can still park, there's a safe wide bikeway and there are two lanes for cars. Now I've got to say I don't really understand the concern about having two lanes of traffic rather than four. I don't get it. I, I remember when Prospect Road was changed from four lanes to two lanes. There was some criticism but that's settled. And personally, I find that the traffic flows much more smoothly there with two lanes. So functionally, the bikeway is doing what was intended. And I believe all your studies bear that out. This is not to say that there couldn't be improvements, especially in Streetscape. I looked up actually your design manual on Streetscape and you say things like, great streets can help us cool and shade the city that streets that are shaded, provide bike lanes and encourage walking, make for a much more livable and sustainable place. So you could improve the bikeway streetscape by keeping the parking and the two lanes of traffic, but use your money to plant trees and ground covers within those concrete barriers that are in the parking lane. They are at least two metres wide, so there's space there to add some bigger shady trees that can spread a bit, adding informality. Plus maybe some clumps of native grasses and ground covers. Maybe add a seat or two, or some outdoor dining on the footpath. Something that encourages pedestrians. It wouldn't cost a lot, and then you could spend more money on more bikeways. So then we looked at the seven proposals to be offered for community consultation. All seven offer a mean, unattractive streetscape. Nothing extra to attract pedestrians. A formal one metre wide line of trees that is too narrow for any real greenness or variety. The trees will have to be extremely tough and any ground covers in between will be trampled in no time by bins or people parking. And a bikeway that is too narrow. We see that bikeway as our main north-south road and we won't feel safe on it, especially with curbs that could clip our pedals and force us to move to the centre. This is not a Copenhagen bikeway, as I heard one councillor say. They are a minimum standard of 2.5 metres wide and I believe now that's gone up to 3 metres. So for some reason, pedestrians, bikes, a green streetscape, even parking, had to get out of the way for King Car at Peak Hour. This is old thinking. Can I remind you about the words in your council publicity? Are these treatments smart, green, livable, creative, or are you simply reacting? And in fact, censoring, because you won't let the community talk about the important stuff. Why? What's driving this? Is there some vested interest here? <laughs> How on earth are you going to manage to get a carbon neutral city when you defy evidence, refuse to explain, and seem to want to encourage cars at any cost? You can't simply say stuff and then do the opposite. This decision is important. It sets the tone and it has to be done properly. If you go ahead with any of these 
seven treatments and build an expensive, unsafe bikeway and a poor street escape, the next council will have to spend more money fixing it up. Just one more second if I may. Rose and I think you should cut the number of treatments for public consultation and add two new ones. One, offering the existing bikeway system with its one lane of traffic each way, and one offering the same existing system, but with an improved streetscape. Thank you for this opportunity. <coughs> Members, any questions? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, you spoke much of attractiveness of the city streetscape and said that a number of the other options were unattractive. Do you consider the concrete upstand curves that are there now to be attractive? They certainly could be improved, Councillor, and that's what I'm suggesting, that you actually use that space, those concrete areas in the parking bays as your free space. That gives you options, that gives you flexibility, and your Town planners, I'm sure, are clever enough to make the absolute most of it. Another question, I mean, are you concerned as a cyclist about hitting those concrete upstand curves? I'm talking about the concrete barriers in the parking lanes. So I am concerned about the plan that flush without that concrete upstand, regardless of the width. So again, some of the proposals have a flush treatment, it's not oh. curves sticking up out of the ground. Yes, I am concerned about those curves because I believe they narrow an already narrow bikeway. Yes, so having a flush treatment would actually be better than this. I don't remember seeing a treatment that was all completely yeah, flush. Option one for jumping is completely flush. There's no curve on between the bike lane and the one meter. But as uh, the no other, like, I think the other speaker also said, there still has to be some barrier between the bikeway and the pedestrian. Yeah, there's the curve, the existing curve. And that stays. That's the problem. That stays, but it's, it's further not there's a curve on the other side of the bikeway. I think the curve is the same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Ne our next speaker is Mr. Peter Lum. <coughs> Welcome, Peter. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair, Lord Mayor, Councillors. Thanks for this opportunity. Henry Ford is believed to have said you can have any colour model T you like, so long as it's black. The designs are not up for approval tonight, are much like Ford's. You can have any road section design you like, so long as it contains a two metre bikeway, a one metre green strip. And this is because changes to four lanes of traffic are required for some unexplained purpose. As the notes provided in the agenda say, there are only subtle variations in each cross section. What these consultation designs ask people to consider is the subtleties at the edges of the two metre bike lanes, the trims on the black Model T, if you like. There are bigger issues to consider, but the electors, the people who move about the city by various modes, aren't allowed to talk about them. What I'm asking councillors for tonight is a wider range of options to consider. Give the citizens a chance to chew on the big issues and not just the subtle variations. Vote against the, these offerings. I'm not asking for anything unusual. A standard consultation process will do. What would this look like? Usually in consultations, the existing design is contrasted with a new design. We need genuine big picture compare and contrast options. Broaden the consultation so that all road users can comment on the existing frame street design and then a new improved version of the street with the existing 2.7 metre bikeway, the existing parking and one traffic lane in each direction option. Then contrast this option, or this offer with the two metre options so that those consulted can offer views on the benefits and disbenefits of that, these arrangements. Simply, consult on the existing, consult on improvements and then the options with subtle variations. Secondly, we need the usual consultation data overview. Apart from the width dimensions, the consultations needs to spell out existing trends. What are the volumes of pedestrians, cyclists and motor vehicles using Frome Street? 
and which directions the volume is changing, up or down. But we also need projections to help us in an informed consultation. The Lord Mayor and the Premier want us to double cycling in the city by 2020, carbon neutral action plan. What kinds of volumes of cars, cyclists and pedestrians can we expect to use these main roads for bikes in the city, the north, south and the east, west? We just don't need section widths, we need volumes, trends and projections. For quality consultation, those consulted need to know about the established <coughs> vision for the city. How will people in a more populous Adelaide move about? What we need to know when we have genuine compare and contrast options, along with the trends and the data projections is, how does each of the options presented align with the city's strategic plan, the Adelaide design manual, the smart move strategy, the 30 year plan for Greater Adelaide, and carbon neutral Adelaide. To increase cycling requires three things, separated infrastructure, safety and convenience. A two metre lane in this city with the widest streets will enhance safety and convenience and we can assume it will increase numbers of cyclists to some extent, especially outside the peak rushes. Is it world's best infrastructure? No. Will it diminish car congestion and cycle congestion in the peak hours? No. Will it encourage people to transport children and cargo in larger bikes and disability trikes? No. Will slower older cyclists like myself feel comfortable when faster younger riders are passing me? No. Passability will be very limited with all the two metre <coughs> subtle variation options being offered for consultation. Citizens are being offered the small capacity black Model T. Right now we have an opportunity in Adelaide to exploit our natural cycling advantages and to move towards being with separated bikeways which truly suit the needs and abilities of all levels of bike road riders. As Fiona Campbell pointed out at the Lord Mayor's Summit, Adelaide has very wide streets. Adelaide can have two metre bike lanes, 2.8 metre bike lanes to quote Fiona in them. If you have a strategy using political courage and political skills. The existing offerings will grow CO2 when you claim to be minimising it. You fail to future proof cycling even though you have the ambitious target of doubling cycling in the next four years. We need more consultation options. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Martin, good uh, Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Lund, for that. Um, now, look, I, I am curious because you're strongly arguing against a two metre bikeway, and yet I know from the documents that you attended the Lord Mayor's design charrette, uh, and it was apparently that design charrette which has informed the choice of two metres. What, was that not the decision of the design charrette or those attending that two metres was the preferred width? Um, well, I, I've read the, the notes from the uh, charrette that are linked into uh, your documents tonight and um, um, recently um, had a look at my own notes. Um, uh, my recollection is when the uh, charrette began, um, we were told that we were being, we were to uh, consider these options, which were all the two metre options, and straight away uh, the experts said uh, that's too limited. We want to consider uh, the existing option with with four lanes of moving uh, with two lanes of moving traffic, not four. And quite recently, the staff said, "Look, council has asked us to consult you on these options." So we then divided it into two groups and I can't speak for the other group, but my group spent quite a lot of time of the, uh, work that we worked on this um, trying to think of ways to expand the width, to get it to 2.5 as a minimum, but we didn't get anywhere with that. We also spent a lot of time on um, um, managing stormwater options, uh, managing stormwater in all those options. I feel like I'm, I've moved from being 
naive to an expert on stormwater management in city streets now. Um, and so we presented our you know, pros and cons for the, the options that we were offered. But the staff, uh, in the face of the pressure, relented at the end and gave us 10 minutes to say what we, why we wanted the four, uh, why we wanted the two lanes of traffic existing profile option. And there was, my, my recollection is, there was a very sort of uh, energised, animated, boom, 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 people saying what they, um, what they wanted. And uh, I mean, I can't remember all the details. I did make notes that Jeremy Woolley from the Automotive Accident um, Research Centre of Adelaide Uni was sitting beside me and he quickly rattled off all the safety features that were uh, benefit from being in the existing configuration rather than four lanes. Uh, people talked about the, the canopies and the amenities which would improve and, and so on. So, no, there was, a, a, there was a lot of resistance to only looking at, a lot of strong people <coughs> only looking at. So, at look, I, 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 I don't want to um, uh, paraphrase it at, uh, at risk of misrepresenting what you're saying. But it seems to me you are saying to me that you felt as though you were steered in a direction rather than being able to discuss the broadest possible suite of options. Well, we, we only had uh, sections. Two metres. Which had two metres, one metre of greenery and four lanes of traffic. They were the only ones we had and there was resistance to that. I see. I see. Um, all right. Um, can I just clarify a point? Uh, Am I correct in forming the view from what you said in the early part of your address that the standard that is being proposed for the Adelaide bikeway is rather than a standard, a solution to the Brome Street perceived problems that is being applied to the citywide uh, bikeway project? Is that a correct interpretation? Well, sorry, sorry Councillor, can you yeah, sure. ask? You seem to be saying that the solution that is being proposed, uh, sorry, that the two metre bikeway that is being proposed is the solution to Frome Street when in fact the standard should be what we should be looking for first. Is that correct? Well, um, yes, I mean, uh, from my, my understanding, which is, you know, reasonable, I think, is that uh, standards uh, are there. Uh, Purposefully, they're um, able to be negotiated to some extent, but they're about the physical realities of space. And um, while I understand that there's no registered Australian standard, the standard which I understand uh, is being used is the Queensland standard, which says that uh, a two metre bike lane is good for up to 150 cycle movements per hour. But beyond 150, which we already have in frame in the peaks, you need to, because there's more people in it and people wanting to overtake, you need a wider lane. And, uh, um, you know, in Australia, the uh, expectation, I think that Fiona Campbell uh, reported in the Lord Mayor's Summit was 2.8. I'm quite happy with 2.7. And 2.8 and the Copenhagen standard starts at three and goes up. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you. Oh, I beg your pardon, Councillor Corbell. Just one question. Um, are you aware that in April, um, sorry, in July 2016, um, the council resolved that um, we would we would enable two lanes of motor vehicle traffic in both direction during peak hours for Fred Street by way of implication for that is that then we would need to remove the existing bike way and therefore reduce the size, the width of the bike way. Uh, yes, I became aware that that decision was made sometime after it was made and I was very disappointed it was made and that there wasn't uh, you know, public consultation on, on that issue because all the evidence is that the existing uh, road section is very highly regarded and popular with cyclists and the Super Tuesday counts indicate phenomenal growth and the City Council's own permanent counter 
the data for which I've been sent um, indicates that uh, cycling traffic continues to go up in Front Street and traffic continues to evaporate. So why would you want to have more lanes of traffic for an evaporating population of motor vehicles? Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so our last present presentation is uh, Dr. Chris Stokes. Stokes. Dr. Chris Stokes. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, you have the floor. <laughs> Good evening all. Um, really the argument that I want to bring forward is that we should make proper consideration of the move from the current two lane or two traffic lane layout to a four lane layout. It's not a real matter. It's not just about efficiency, there are going to be safety costs. Um, a few points to that argument essentially are that you go from two lanes to four lanes, you're going to be increasing the amount of conflict points. So this is at intersections and along the block. Um, the other thing is it also increases the complexity of the roadway. So some examples of that are drivers making right-hand turns at intersections or trying to come out of any of the side streets. Um, it's a lot more difficult to turn right of course over two lanes than there's over one lane. And another example would be pedestrians along the roadway, not that are walking along the footpath and trying to cross the roadway. Trying to cross four lanes is always going to be a lot more difficult than crossing two lanes. Um, this is especially important along Frome Road. Of course, we have a lot of pedestrians along there. We've also got uh, the CBC school there at the moment, so there's a lot of school children. And if we look further north, there's also going to be a new Adelaide High School. So there are a lot of school children along there. Um, pedestrians are another one that need to be considered as well as cyclists. Um, really going to or keeping the two lane layout has a very good traffic calming effect. And this is just beneficial in terms of the safety and amenity for all road users. And the argument I'm really trying to bring forward at the moment is this is about the safety and amenity for all road users. It's not just going to be about cyclists or about drivers and how everyone using the road. So just rehash my argument really is that there needs to be proper consideration before we just decide to go for a four lane layout. Thank you. Members, anyone who's got any questions? Yeah, Thank you. If not, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you to everyone who's spoken. We very much appreciate when our community comes and tells us what they think, so we're very grateful for your time you've taken. Um, members, that brings us to um, item five of the agenda, which is uh, the Chair's approval report. I don't have one. Uh, we've already dealt with item six. So, um, the Lord Mayor, you called out um, item seven. <coughs> I did, thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, Chair, I will, uh, what I propose to do here is speak to this matter, acknowledging that I may foreshadow towards the end of my five minutes move to make a variation in my amendment, but I will take advice from Senator Administration about how I do that procedurally. So I'll take a second if I can on what is printed in order to start the amendment. Or do you need somebody else to move it if you're seeking to make, move an amendment later on? I think it might be better off giving someone else to move it. Uh, a variation, Chair. A variation? Chair, yeah. yeah. I will proceed no and I will tell my fellow yeah. members to take the, uh, take the cue. Um, Chair, I must say. Just, just one more minute, if you don't mind, Ben. Yes. Um, if you're seeking to, you, you won't be able to necessarily vary it. Is that, is that a consideration for you now? Because I'm sure somebody also may be for the purpose of getting the debate started if you want to keep your options open. Councillor Adams, Andy would like to do that. Yeah, thank you. So moved by Councillor. Why can't the Lord Mayor amend the regulation and move it as a Oh, sorry, you can go ahead and move, it, move an amendment right now. Yeah, uh, but what I understood that he was trying to do was speak to it first and then move an amendment later. So, no, sorry. A variation, not an amendment, is appropriate, is it not? Yeah, yeah, probably appropriate. I just thought that the Lord Mayor was suggesting that he wasn't going to do yeah. that straight away, that he was going to do it later. So if you're going to do it straight away, that's no problem. He doesn't have to move a variation, but he just amends the motion and calls it. I understand that. I understand 
Well, I'm trying to see the Lord Mayor. I didn't understand that the Lord Mayor was seeking to move either an amendment or a variation at the moment. I thought he was seeking to move the motion as printed and then later do something. I'm trying to work that out. Lord Mayor, could you explain to me what you'd like to do? Thank you, Chair. I would like to take advice to my good from administration as to the best way to do this procedurally. But uh, what I would like to do before I seek a second to speak to this matter, Chair, is to, uh, with regard to uh, most particularly, uh, because it's this is in the subtext of what's been recommended here, is that uh, most particularly with regards to the section of from existing between Carrington and Perry, I would like in this recommendation, noting of course, Chair, that this is to inform consultation and this will come back to us at a later date, I would like to have it acknowledged in wording my intent for when we go out to consultation with regard to the piece of Chrome Street located between Carrington Street and right down to North Terrace, that we include in that consultation piece the option for the general public to comment on options one and option six. So, so I would need some help with wording of how that would actually Okay, fit so we're just trying to get them. Um, um, okay, look. So, um, administration, we're, we're moving an amended motion. Can we have a look where that might fit in? No, I'm not. I want to speak to that. It's not specific in here, is it? Can you just go down to 2.1 again? Approves. Who's the owner of it? Daniel, Daniel, um, I wonder whether you could help us about where or how we might articulate what the Lord Mayor is trying to achieve into the motion. Yes, through the chair. Um, options for design, typology, treatment one and six is in attachment A. And that outlines, I think, what the Lord Mayor is referring to. Um, Flash back on the surface treatment and treatment six, which is the um, the Turban Median Islands. Mm. The treatment one and treatment six, that's for attachment A. Where, so it, so where, where do we say this in the motion? Yeah. Further? Does it need to be specific? Yeah. Yeah, I might be able to help you. Yeah. Um, variation to the attachment B, page 21. Uh, sections Piri Street to Victoria Drive. Sorry, the, the, the section between Piri Street, my yeah. mum's the section most particularly between Carrington Street through to North Terrace, principally be consulted on the basis of preferred treatments of options one or six. Okay, so let's see where, in which paragraph are we seeking to put that in, Lord Mayor? Uh, I require Daniel's assistance with this, but the general uh, reading that would be two point two. Yeah, and you two point two. It would be two point. It would be an inclusion of two point two. Just two point two, and it's attachment A. Sorry, attachment B. I beg your pardon. Is that the map? If we actually currently refer to treatment six. What wording does it? Treatment twenty four. That, well, that's where the change will be. Can you read your your um. Um, so, Chair, if there was a new 2.1 and thus 2.2 became 2.3, what I would be suggesting is something along the lines of, for the purposes of community consultation, the uh, portion of Frome Street uh, between Carrington Street to North Terrace uh, have options one and option six as the principal options for public comment. And Councillor Moran, you've seconded that. And we put it in there at, at um, 2.2, Lord Mayor, I think that, that still works actually. Approves the release, then, then, then says for the purposes of consultation that these are the two principles and then three notes for the report. Okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, um, look, I take some pride in leading a council which is uh, embarking on the single largest investment into cycling infrastructure in the history of the city of Adelaide. Our intent is to create a north, south and east west corridor. So, Chair, I don't want this debate to exclusively focus on a relatively small portion of Prime Street. Uh, I think we need to lift our sights a little higher and look towards delivering a best practice solution for a much larger ultimately part of the city. Um, we all, of course, acknowledge the importance of cycling. 
uh, and we were inherited a piece of design infrastructure which if we were to roll it out in that current design, the cold hard reality is we would have rolled out nothing. So everybody would have had the existing piece of Chrome Street and enjoyed it and enjoyed nothing more. I don't see that as a great benefit for those in the city of Adelaide and beyond the chair. We need to achieve a design solution which uh, provides safety, amenity and acceptance by various user groups. And this is where chair, the previous if not the existing piece, served only to polarise the community, not to include it. And Chair, this solution, I believe, and I genuinely look forward to public view on this, was predicated on, one, a partnership with State Government of South Australia. We are 50% of this equation members. We're not 100%, as you know. It was predicated on a motion led by Council Moran, which was successful and endorsed by this council, as Councillor Corbell shared with us, which predicated that the redesign of Frome Street was based on a return of traffic and two lanes in either direction during peak hour only. And our administration has done precisely what is being asked of them. <coughs> is that in order for that to happen, the liquid cycling infrastructure needs to be the decision <coughs> two metres either side so that that council motion, as decided by us members, can be enabled. And this is on the basis on which we're now going out to our community to discuss. I'd like everyone to consider the bigger picture here. Segregated cycling corridors in two directions across our city of considerably longer length than the front street pathway has existing. That is the aspiration we want to deliver at this council for our community and for our city. We want to do it right. We want to stop the polarised debate which has plagued this council for far too long. In fact, polarising debates plagued this council for far too long, Chair. We need to stop these factuous relationships and we need to work for our community and deliver top quality infrastructure. Safety for cyclists, segregated, cy um, segregated infrastructure for cyclists, greener streets for our residents. And this is why, Chair, I'm advocating for principally option one. Because options two, three, four, and five members are predicated on one thing moving the gutter. And you move the gutter, you move the drainage you move the drainage and you run into tens of millions of dollars. We don't have that within our budget. Option one enables us to preserve the gutter, as Councillor Wilkinson said. On the other side is have no gutter, so the pedal strike matter is illegal. <coughs> On the street side or the footpath side, there will be a gutter. We do need to have drainage. However, I have asked our administration as to whether in places we would be able to move, uh, change over that gutter without changing over the drainage and having a rolled gutter. There's a more technical term for that. Daniel, what is it? I threw the chair into roll over curb. A roll over curb, thank you. <laughs> we would have a roll over curb, which then would thus help alleviate the pedal strike on the other side. Which to me, listening to the very valued opinions of our community, that is a concern. It's a very genuine one. So in places along our north-south corridor and our east-west corridor chair, we may be able to have a rolled over uh, gutter or rolled over curb, which will be a fraction of the cost of moving the drainage below it, and thus enabling a very good outcome, <coughs> not only financially, for our cycling community, thus alleviating pedal strike, and also maintaining the support of our residents, our motorists, our investors, our property owners, our small businesses, because surely members, it's our job in terms of delivering this infrastructure for our community is to work for our community, all parts of our community. And that's why I'm suggesting, Chair, that we have a reasonable solution here, recognising that it's not a perfect world, Chair. So I move that we reflect that, Chair, and uh, that first consultation on that basis. Lord Mayor, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I'm sorry to do this. I know you're speaking, but I need to adjourn. I need to call for an adjournment of this meeting. Um, uh, so could someone adjourn? Yeah, thank you. Moved by Councillor um, Milani and seconded by Councillor Corbell. Can I put that? All those in favour? That's carried. Councillor Abiad. I declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting open on Tuesday, the 22nd of November 2016 at 6.32pm. I seek someone to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Peschel. In your favour. I put the adjournment. All those in favour? All those against.
carry meetings of theirs. <laughs> Thank you. And um, just for the purposes of the audience, just to let you know that we need to do that because uh, we have to start the other meeting at, within the time limit. Otherwise, the meeting have to be abandoned. The second meeting have to be abandoned for the night. So we're back to our meeting now. I declare our meeting reopened. And sorry, Lord Mayor. Sorry for you for the interruption. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm sure Judy won't teach my time for that bring us loop. <laughs> Chair, we are indeed working towards a carbon neutral city and I want to have a very real chance to achieve that. We will achieve that in many ways, more cyclists on our city streets, absolutely we will. But we will also achieve it by welcoming the advent of the electric car. We're laying out 40 electric vehicle charging stations on our city streets in 2017, We're improving the energy efficiency of our buildings. We are putting solar people on rooftops of our homes and businesses. We're doing a myriad of things. You cannot rely on one in order to achieve carbon neutrality, Chair. The, um, uh, I look at confrontation. Uh, we had a Lord Mayor's uh, Cycling Summit, which was well attended. There was a design charrette, and I'll just correct my fellow Councillor, Councillor Mark, it wasn't the Lord Mayor's design charrette, it was the Lord Mayor's event. The Lord Mayor was not in attendance, Chair. Um, but however, uh, we are. this is part of the consultation phase. And for those who have not yet seen Track 23, which is the demonstration projects uh, of these various treatments we're discussing, Members and members of our gallery, please do go down to the Park 23, which is on the top of Anzac Highway, and have a look. You'll get a very good sense of what these could look like in terms of the quality finishes, the greening, the safety, the separations, everything. It's a wonderful means, and I commend our administration chair for that very innovative means of public consultation on this project. Well done, terrific. So I think we're ultimately all working towards the same thing. Um, we want safer cycling, we want a better city, we want better streets, we want more people living, working, uh, investing in our city. Uh, that is a key KPI for this council. I think this does that and we are responding to the needs of a partnership with the state government, a motion from this council, and I think we need to look larger than a relatively small section of uh, Rome because we're going to be delivering segregated cycling right across our city in two directions, and this is the largest investment in cycling infrastructure in the history of this council. I commend my members for that. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Moran, a second. Chair, can I just ask a question about the motion? Uh, is 2.1 and 2.2 conflicting? Can I just give you a scope for 2.1? <laughs> because that says release the overall concept, which I think means includes everything. Yes. And then my understanding of this, but for the purpose of the second, put them as the principal one uh, options one and six as the principal options for public comment, which is not to say that people won't be asked to comment on everything, but saying that these are the first. Okay. That's my take. Yeah. Councillor Martin, oh, sorry, Councillor Maloney, did you wish to speak or just have a question for me? I, I will in a minute, thank you, Chair. Councillor Martin. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move an amendment. Please go ahead. Uh, and the amendment says that the Economic and Community Development Committee recommends to Council that Council defers consideration of the City of Adelaide Bikeways project pending the provision of further design topologies that will provide best practice safe and low stress cycle tracks across the city and also meets that meet the needs of Trope Street stakeholders. I'll read that again. It defers consideration of the City of Adelaide Bikeways project. Just Slow it down yet, we're up to that. What Pending the provision of further design topologies. Go ahead. That will provide best practice, yep. safe and low stress cycle tracks across the city. and also meet the needs of Chrome Street stakeholders. Seconded by Councillor Corbell. Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, members, you don't need to tell, uh, need to tell you that the presentations uh, tonight did not agree with the proposals uh, before you uh, tonight. Um, the proposals, as has been pointed out, reduce the width of bikeways in the city to two metres. 
And as we now know, uh, the majority of those who attended the design charit, that is industry and government representatives, including road safety experts, all said do not adopt two metres. And here we are on the verge of adopting two metres, the, uh, the Model T option, as one of our speakers put it. Um, and yet the national default standard has already been mentioned, and as I mentioned in a question last week, uh, Queensland TN28 says the Frame Street cycle track should be 2.5 to 3.5 metres to accommodate peak traffic movements of around 2.20 an hour. And, and that is acknowledged in the administration's papers before us. And that is going to increase substantially if we are serious about meeting our carbon neutral policy. Um, now, let me just say that TN28 is not just a Queensland standard. If you go to the UK and if you check out, Sus uh, check out Sustrand, which is the, the strongest cycling group which works with the national government and with regional governments or local councils in developing bikeways, which is endorsed by all of the leading institutes of engineers, road safety experts, and traffic planning societies, they say a minimum width of 2.5 metres. And they say that because there is a science to it that is ignored. <laughs> now, let me just take you through it. The minimum bike width is around 75 centimetres. And then there is movement from side to side. That is calculated by various groups as being about 25 centimetres. And then for safe passing, there is an allowance of around 50 centimetres. So one cycle, separation, and then another cycle, you end up with 2.5 metres. That's, that's how it's arrived at. And it gets even wider if you have a gutter lift. And it doesn't matter how big it is, whether it's a rollover gutter or not. Sustrans, uh, particularly, it talks about <coughs> any kind of impediment you need to allow, on top of that, another 20 centimetres to avoid head strike. And if there's a vertical element, as is proposed in our model with greening, then according to Sustrans, you need to allow at least another 60 centimetres between the vertical element and the bicycle track. So that is the science. Check out the website. You'll see it all for yourself. Have a look also at Copenhagen Design Company too, because uh, it's been said many times, Councillor Moran has advocated the uh, Copenhagen example. Denmark has a minimum 2.5 metres. That is the bikeway standard, their preferred standard, and they are moving wider still to three metres. Now, we're supposed to be designing a cycle track for the city for the safety of all users, and at two metres, many users won't be able to use it. For example, what about mums with kids in basket or cargo bikes that currently use Rome Street? And they do. The width of a mum's cargo bike with kid inside, and, and you can have a look at all these models, they are actually on sale in Adelaide, and I, I mentioned one, the Dutch cargo bike and the whole of family models, old here, its width is 90 centimetres. At the one metre average bike width, mum and the kid, and the internationally accredited 50 centimetres, and you've got 2.4 metres. That is the standard. That is the standard for safety. Now, we're going to pretty much say to mums and kids, no go. You can't. Dads and kids. Well, dads and kids, fine. And at the, and at the same time, there's uh, uh, the issue of uh, the disabled. Now, hand cycles, which are used by the disabled, who currently use that track, are also wider than the standard. They will not fit in the model that's proposed. Now, I want to say also that um, uh, there's a, a risk of a cost blowout in all this, and I, I heard what was said earlier about option one and option six. Option one, according to the administration's bay, and it is bay because they haven't calculated it properly yet, option one is about three to four million dollars a kilometre. Now, if you were to roll that out as it's proposed, you'd need somewhere around about 20 to 30 million dollars across the city. If you ran a mixture of cheaper, and indeed that's what's proposed in the administration's recommendation here, that is at Frome Street from Carrington Street, is the cheaper option six, which is about a million dollars a kilometre, um, you will get around about the, uh, the, the cost. But the problem is 
that you're looking at a infrastructure proposal for Prome Street that's not much better than what we've got. So what's being proposed is just a narrowing of the bikeway to two metres, which excludes a great many current users, including families and the disabled. This really does need further work. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Corbella, seconder. Thank you. Um, look, it, is, it can be polarising in this discussion. We've had it before last year. We made a decision, Council made a decision last year um, to actually base this work and the concept of buying options on removing the existing bikeway to permit for um, greater traffic movement. And originally, I've always, right from the start, pushed for um, Prime Street Bikeway to have minimal design changes. Last year, we did an independent evaluation and a recommendation came back that we just made some simple changes, green surface treatment at signalised intersections, reshape some traffic violence, replace bike tracks at Eiffel Street and develop an awareness campaign around the use of the bikeway. Um, there were no negative issues that were identified to do with travel time for motorists, traffic on adjacent routes, property values, trading conditions for businesses, including servicing business deliveries, availability of on-street parking, on-street parking, collection of garbage bins, attractiveness of the streets. There was a positive impact of the number of people cycling, including more women and children and people dressed in typical everyday wear riding to work rather than lycra um, and general comfort for bike riders. And I'm interested to see from the elected body now, which is several months on and a slightly different council as well, considering now we have Councillor Vershaw, um, what the appetite would be to go back to looking at having a, a wider bikeway. I, I want to see it extended. I absolutely want to see it extended. But what is the appetite from elected members now to go back and do some more concept work about keeping a wider bikeway and how we can do that? I'd like to hear from other elected members. That's what this is seeking to achieve. And actually, if Councillor Martin hadn't have done this, I was drafting up a similar deferral motion myself. And Councillor Milan again, Councillor Moran, and then the Lord. I'll just put in my two cents worth. Um, I certainly don't, uh, I don't support the um, substantive motion for me tonight. I'm tempted to support this and I hear the debate, but ultimately my position would be, and it always has been, to retain the bikeway as it is. It's 250 metres or so bike uh, lane. To retain it as is, improve it. I think it can be um, improved, but leave it at 2.7 um, and don't touch the Carrington, Carrington to Puri Street section. That's always been my view. Um, but I'm open to going to Puri to North Terrace consultation on one and six with a an additional um, uh, one lane traffic in each direction option. I think that would be a very interesting piece of work to see what the consultation would come back um, if we did put some diverse options into the consultation. But um, I, I don't support the substantive. To get my way, it might be only the deferral that I might actually get that outcome, but I'll foreshadow that that is my thinking um, should, uh, should uh, this fail, I guess, um, to, to go to leave Carrington to Puri as it is and do consultation on Puri to North Terrace with treatment to one to six with an alternative 2.7 metre two lane of traffic option. Thanks, Councillor Maloney. Councillor Moran. Look, initially, um, back, way back, I agreed with Natasha that um, we've met with, with balls that are, so to speak, um, <laughs> and uh, we should just uh, fiddle around the edges and then get it right, keeping going. Um, but that, that horse has bolted a bit. This council has resolved, and we can't forget that this came from a resolution of council that we return it to a four lane road with a dedicated bike path, a separated bike path, and parking um, at non-rush hour. Now we've, we've all agreed that. You can't say, well, I didn't vote for that, I've, I've decided something. Oh, this work has come from that resolution um, that, that was carried by a good majority. 
So whatever your previous things, if you want it kept there, just so you've always wanted that the kept there. Natasha doesn't like it, but she doesn't want to spend any more money on it. Um, I can see where you're coming from, but you've got to get with the program. We are now left our argument behind, and we've asked our staff to go out and get some options. Now, the option that they chose is one that's not very popular, but that, that is one that we'll, what the substantive motions are suggested put, is put in their consultation. I agree with the Lord Mayor, option one. I, um, is I think the most elegant, um, uh, least change to the street, still gives a good vodka result. Um, so as I said, don't go back to that. Now arguing about um, this change, oh, oh so it's Groundhog Day, do we really want to go back and do that? It's ridiculous. The, the gallery has a certain view, they are a small group um, and you have been elected to lead this city. And we've been hearing from the government, who promised to has given, given us a lot of money to continue these. They do not like front road. And they are the bike ways government. And they've said, it's rubbish how the hell you ever did it, especially since we did Sturt Road, Road Sturt Street first. Now, there's no argument about dedicated bike lanes. Everybody, the paper, paper suggests that you're a nice house, rip it all out. I'm not saying rip it out. I'm saying rip out the garden beds that stop the parking. Make it what Copenhagen has, an efficient way for pedestrians, cyclists, and bikes to get around. We walk on footpaths through the street. If it's a wide street, we get a wide footpath. If it's a narrow street, we get a narrow footpath. We can still overtake each other on the narrow footpath. It might be a bit spotty. Bike paths are like that. It has to fit the street. Now, whether you like it or not, we voted to put four lanes of traffic there during rush hour. That does not allow a three metre bike path. The width of the, the width of the bike path depends on the width of the road. Now, the Lord Mayor and others, I'm not so fussed about it, want a little bit of greening in there, want a bit of beautification. So it goes from, I think, 2.3 to 2. There is no, uh, there is no um, stand, Australian standard on bike paths. There's no Australian standard in Denmark, and there's nothing in the Dutch thing. That there are recommended for widths of the road. They're suggested. We have to fit what we do. Phil can change it all he likes. I, and read the Dutch standard, and that it suggests. There's no Dutch standard. There's a, there's a, a, a standard. No, I emailed you the Dutch cycling um, companion. No, no. don't you read my email? <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniel has got it too. It is. Um, I'm just wondering if you can read it because you are talking out of your hat. Um, if you haven't, there is no um, standard width for bike path, and I'm sick of hearing that. Brisbane laid theirs down at 2.7 metres to to match the width of their street. That's what they could fit in. Because they were the first bike paths laid down, they were used as a standard. There was no science behind it. There was no science behind the width of ours either. It was just to fit the truck that sweeps the streets down it. That's what that width was worked out to be. So now we want to return it to four lanes at peak hour and have parking at other times. We have to narrow the lane. Talking about uh, mummies and babies and disabled people is, is really, I think, disappointing. Um, it is a bike lane. Most of our bike lanes are less than 2.7 metres and they manage to get down them quite happily then. I think to, to argue and to continue this, tragic debate that's gone for years and years and years will delay the bike lane. I urge you to vote against this and vote for the substantive and get it out to consultation. Don't take any more of these delaying motions. Lord Mayor, then Councillor Antic, then Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I read Councillor Moran's emails, all of them. <laughs> the, uh, I, strongly, I strongly speak against this amendment, Chair. Strongly speak against it. Uh, members, my greatest consideration here is the work done to strike an effective partnership with the State Government of South Australia. Minister Mulligan is on record saying if that is the high water market of design and cycling infrastructure, God help us. So do we want to have, I think the question we need to be asking ourselves members is, do we want to get on with the job with delivering a higher quality, more sustainable, more appropriate 
cycling design in a north, south, east, west corridors right across our city. Members, play with fire on this one. You will get burned. Are you? I want us to deliver. I want us to get out to public consultation. I generally want to hear what our community has to say about the options we're putting to them. We need to rise above the X number of metres along Frome Street and recognise that is a reality, that is a motion of this council. That is a motion of this council. Our administration has done exactly what we've asked of them. And we need to rise above the paralysis of indecision. We have delivered a $12 million cycling infrastructure. Now, it's fun. I would expect that everybody in our gallery members would be ecstatic, ecstatic about a council that's delivered $12 million. If we jeopardise that through playing semantics and playing politics on a small stretch of road, God help us. God help us. This project will be stillborn. And I will not let it happen on my watch. Well, obviously, Lord Mayor, I, I also uh, like support this uh, amendment. Um, what hasn't been said and needs to be said. Um, I, I, I mean, I lament this. I, you know, we, we are talking about a very, very short stretch of road. We are talking about a council that has endorsed the concept of safe cycling in the city and indeed agreed to um, uh, to extend it, um, but only in t on terms which allow for a too balanced. Uh, approach to uh, to transport, and that's what we're trying to achieve here. The, there are always going to be arguments about design this and design that and design this, but as the Lord Mayor quite rightly says, um, the substantive motion is the, um, in my view, uh, compromised position. I mean, I, I lament how long this entire process has taken. I mean, I, I don't see other cities of the world spending, I mean, we're two years into this council. Now, you can well imagine Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. Uh, having built the Death Star by now. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I just don't understand why we're still going around and around the circles on this. I mean, th this is, in my view, the substantive is, is the compromise position. Um, we need to get on with it. I would prefer to see go through quicker, but like all things in our current world, we must have a citizen's jury in order to determine whether we consult on a citizen's jury. Um, we're still going around and around the mulberry bush. Let's get on with it. Let's vote this down and get on the substantive and get on with remediating the mess that currently Front Street represents. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson, you have the Councillor Wilkinson, you have yeah, the a couple of questions of the administration. Um, in uh, option one, that Councillor Martin talked about the cost of that, um, that option one has got concrete the curb to the one metre garden strip. Option six um, has asphalt between the curb and the garden. I've been advised by our administration that we uh, can't have asphalt coming up. To so option six wouldn't be like that. It would, it would have to have a 300 wide concrete curb because I can't run the bitumen right up to the curb. So in option six really is not that width by the way. It's that less that curb can get that thing that narrow tyres gets. It. So I mean that option is doesn't seem to be quite resolved. And the thing is, um, I mean, I wouldn't want to see us poo pooing option one based on cost, which has got the flush garden there, but no, no tank tracks for anyone to ride into in favour of option six because it's cheaper because it's just got bitumen when it would actually have to have a concrete bit there. So option one could be done. If, if option six could be done, bitumen all the way to the curb, then why couldn't option one be done with the bitumen the curb? Why could option one be done with this uh, treatment that our staff have shown us down at Henley Beach where they, they put a sand colour coating over bitumen to get a visual differentiation? So, Councillor Wilkinson, I'm going to sort of take that as a question in, in one sense because yeah. um, the administration have asked to make a comment in relation to the consultation. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to move to, to um, Beth Edson Parks for a sec to talk about what the consultation will enable because I think what you're saying is. Maybe there are some other options that might be one to be. And another variation is the garden bed. You know, okay. if so you have a comment? 600 wide, this is proposed in one metre, but if we had a 600 wide and a narrow road like that, then you could give a 2.4 metre bikeway so without just, limiting traffic. Let's just it? see what the, cons what the consultation will allow. So, Beth, if you wouldn't mind just giving a question. Oh, certainly, Chair, thank you. Through you. Um, attachment C to the um, report before you tonight, members is the um, engagement strategy summary. It talks about the engagement date 
Then it also talks about the various um, other methods and approaches that we'll be using as a part of the community engagement throughout the remainder of this next phase of engagement and future phases for this project. Um, clearly, the, the typologies or treatments that, um, that we have before you tonight and that the um, design charrette looked at will form a part of that engagement and depending on the final vote tonight, there may well be the principal um, focus of, for different areas. But I'd just really like to reinforce that each engagement session or each um, opportunity for interaction with our community will include an opportunity for people to add additional ideas, thoughts, designs that they would like to see. So clearly the options that we put forward are within the parameters we've been asked to do that. But just as at the design charrette at the end of it, as Mr Lum pointed out, there was an opportunity to add some additional comments. We will ensure that happens right through all of the engagement sessions and we will faithfully bring that back to council. Um, I think we said early 2017, probably March 2017 will be coming back. Um, and we'll have to record all of the comments. Thank you, Chair. So I just think that might help Council Wilkinson in the sense that even though the, whatever we come up with tonight, if there is uh, options presented, if, if the substantive gets up and options are presented, it won't mean that that's the only thing that people are entitled to comment. The public will get opportunity to present two bobs and variations. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Can I don't ask the question about that because yeah. I've asked why we can't just run the kitchen, but I'm offering the design team into this one. Um, ben, ben, do you want to tackle option six? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, in answer to why you cannot bring the picture of the up to the curves, the curves are not quite um, commonly yellow, but it means something to hold in place. It's generally constructed as a T. Um, so you have to run the bitumen up to a concrete edge, otherwise the concrete purpose of tip over and it needs to be reinforced with having a with a, a wider concrete path that could be done, that's the question of material. Yeah. 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 So, Councillor Wilkinson, just bearing in mind that we're debating the, um, the amendment, which is a referral yeah. motion at the moment, do you, do you have any other questions or points? Um, well, I I um, endorse what the Lord Mayor is saying in terms of getting on I mean, I think that um, the display that I think I should put on certainly help the current public government with that. Certainly for me, it made fairly easy, no brainer that option one is the logical, economical, and doable, repeatable, good looking without tank traps, and, and allows the maximum possible width of bike lane on, on wide streets. Um, so I'm happy to go with a good idea and a dumb idea, it exists. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm hoping it's Councillor Carahan, you wanted to speak and then oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to support this because I think it's important that we listen to what the cyclists are telling us. This is their passion, this is their interest, and we're hearing tonight that they don't feel safe with a two metre wide cycling lane. And if we go back to why we've come to this, it's because council did agree to reintroduce four lanes of traffic into that section of Frome Road. I don't support it, but it was a council decision. Now, we've just heard today that, you know, we're playing semantics and playing politics. Well, I actually believe that we are by not considering what we're hearing from cyclists and users. We know that this, there's, a, a, ground, there's a, a number of people out there who want the four lanes returned during peak hour traffic. But what we're having, we continue to look at this in isolation, I agree, because I've never had a problem travelling down that section of the road, ever. I've never been held up. And yet I get held up 
as soon as I come to the section before the Prince Albert Bridge to, um, towards the river. It just doesn't make any sense. I have never been held up on that stretch of road in peak hour traffic. And yet, you, if you're travelling to North Adelaide, you get stuck before the bridge <coughs> and even after the bridge. So you can't even blame the bridge. So it, it's just a nonsense. I fail to be convinced of the need to retru return this section to four lanes and to sacrifice what we are being told is a safe and I didn't is a safe and comfortable is a safe and comfortable width for people to ride bikes. To me, this is real back to the future stuff. This is about it's ignoring all young girl told us. And it's about giving priority back to the back to the car traffic as, and sacrificing the safety uh, and the desire to increase the number of cyclists. So I am happy to support this deferral until we can come up with a model with something to go out with that retains it as the same. Councillor Virtual. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't support the deferral. Um, I would rather get this out to the public for their feedback. Um, if there are, I, I agree with Sandy in terms of, you know, the opportunity to have a look at it. Um, if there are other ways that we could come back in terms of that one metre being lesser, which might still give us a 2.5 metre cycle path that can come from the public, that can, can come from the consultation. Um, I uh, did a lot of work with cycling, as some of you know, a few years back as the director of the Velo City Conference. And I would much rather us be able to roll out this cycle path across the city than get stalled at this point, which is where we've been for more than two years. There is a decision of council. We need to take this out to consultation. We need to get the feedback from from our public. I thank everybody for speaking today. It was really was really great to hear your views. And we are not ignoring your views. We're actually saying through the consultation, we have an avenue for that to come back into council. And it simply means that we reduce the um, surface treatment and still have it uh, 2.5 cycle way then I think that we will have a great outcome right across the city. Oh, the one question, um, sorry, we both had, was about the cost of treatment one, um, the per kilometre cost. I think um, Councillor Martin said 20 to 30 million. Through the Chair, our estimates are very high level. We haven't done a lot of investigations. We anticipate somewhere between three and five million. We haven't done enough investigations to confirm that up. Um, Councillor Martin, before I return to your seat, leave for the meeting to also speak to this very briefly, given it's an issue close to my heart. Well, it depends on whether you're going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking the same outcome, but I am going to speak against the um, against the amendment. Um, and, and for this reason, um, I'm a passionate cyclist, as you know, and I want us to get the best outcome for that uh, for that area. But what we're putting out um, for consultation are the typologies. Um, and for me, what the, that is, is getting a sense of what the community say about the footpaths versus the um, and the surfacing and the edging. And the, uh, I know that as part of that, we're also putting out the two metres. But, but I would very much like that our community gives us feedback on the two metres. I, what I want to do is not waste time so we can nail the typology, we can nail the look and feel, the way that it's built, but the way that we deal with stormwater and the, and the surfacing and the edging. Um, but I would I would very much like, as part of that consultation, we've been assured that there's, there's going to be an opportunity for that, that the feedback that we get may well tell us, we love that typology, we're going to go with typology one, or typology six or typology 27, um, but we want it to be 2.5 metres or 2.7 metres or, uh, or something else. Uh, I don't think sticking with our original motion precludes that. In fact, I think it actually facilitates it. Um, uh, it's, it's potentially reaching the same objective as yours, um, trying to get to Councillor Martin, but it's just not holding us up while we do it. Um, so that's why I'm going to support the original motion rather than if the amendment doesn't get it. Thank you. 
Um, sorry, for you to sum up. Yeah, look, thank you, Chair. Look, I understand the emotion associated with this uh, because there is enormous political risk in going either way. Uh, and the Lord Mayor and others have staked their reputations and uh, indeed campaigned on fixing Chrome Street. That was the catch cry, let's fix it. Now, in the process of trying to deal with the political dimension, there are so many red herrings being dragged across the bike track. The first is that you can actually uh, put out a series of design topologies with a two metre width. Width is the key, that is the key to this. That is what the public representations are saying. They are saying two metres does not provide a safe, low stress cycling environment. And that information has been imparted to council time and time again, during the bike summit, during the, the, uh, the charrette that was conducted by council, at which road safety and other experts said, no, 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 not two metres, 2.5 or greater. So the width is key to this. It's key to the issue of safety. It's key to accessibility for people like families and the disabled. And it's all very well, I accept, you know, that it's a, a, a pretty um, uh, inappropriate thing, in, inflammatory thing is what Councillor Moran regards mention of our ratepayers as, that is families and disabled who ride machines that will not be accommodated on the two metre width. That is what you're going out to consult with. Well, the, the second red hearing, uh, and I'm happy for you to speak to this, the second red oh, hearing <laughs> is that <laughs> somehow option one is possible. The length of the proposed north, south and east, west bikeways is seven kilometres. If it is proposed, seriously proposed, and you've got to ask yourself this, that those seven kilometres be covered with a treatment that is three to five million dollars a kilometre, that is seven times five, 35 million in the worst case scenario. We have 11 million, 11 million dollars in the kitty for this project. You're dreaming if you think that option one has any opportunity of getting out. We need to be much smarter than to fall for that. We actually need to think seriously about what's on offer here. And there is no shame, and there's nothing inappropriate about putting on hold a motion that says four lanes in order to investigate some further options. Now, those options could include the range of things that were suggested by Councillor Malani. It may be appropriate to leave Frame Street exactly as it is. It may be appropriate for another treatment in another place. But at the moment, the direction to the administration and the information going out to the public is that it should be two metres. That narrows the scale of thinking, and in my view, it's entirely inappropriate. Now, there is no harm in asking for further information. That is a reasonable course of action. If it takes another six or eight weeks, let me tell you, the pain of that wait will be substantially less than the public outcry about some pie in the sky, $35 million cycleway that is not deliverable which excludes people like families and the disabled and shrinks it to a level at which it's not safe. Think about that. Six to eight weeks that have a series of other options put before you or alternatively dive heading, crash or crash through. It seems to me the most prudent option is simply to ask the administration to take on board the matters that have been put forward with some sincerity by Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Malani, Councillor Corbell and others and allow us the opportunity to make a more informed decision. I just ask you to support this. It's not asking for anything more than information to make the best possible decision. So all those in favour of the amendment? Um, all those against? The amendment's failed. The division. division's, the division's been called. All those voting in favour of the amendment, please rise. Councillor Corbell, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Clarahan. Don't do anything. Declared against. That's declared against. So that brings us back to the substantive. Um, and I think we've all. Um, Councillor Milani, you wish to speak to the substantive motion? Yeah. 
Thank you. Yes, I was convinced in that um, debate that um, let's get it up for consultation. <coughs> They can say two meters, two point seven. So I'm very much comforted that we can go down that pathway. Um, but my view still stays the same as to uh, not spend too much money on ripping up what's already there. It's two hundred and fifty meters of bikeway. My whatever it is, a few hundred meters. Um, I've never, you know, haven't paced it, but um, it's, it's. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, but um, I just want to get on with the consultation, essentially. Um, and I guess I'll have that debate at a later time when we actually go to make a decision, which would be ideal, on this project. Because uh, so I've been reassured by my fellow members that um, we can have that debate down the track. Let's get it out for consultation. Giving out council a very short point, I urge those who don't support 20 meters to let us know that it's 2.7 as a preference for two lanes, with two lanes of traffic. My view is we should retain what we've done. Let's not waste too much money on redoing it. It can be improved, um, but I would like to see us get on with the consultation from Piri to North Terrace, not to mention East West. We haven't even started talking about East West yet. Um, I'd like to do it you know, before I'm 90. So um, uh, I, let's just get it out there and go to consultation. So again, speaking to the uh, substantive, Councillor Moran, you reserved your right, I think, you a second to um, please go ahead and ask the same Councillor Paul Bell, I don't think you've spoken. No, yes, she's she's the 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 main um, topic of the last election was to fix my mind. We all said it. We will fix it. The Lord Mayor, no, you did not. Thank you. <laughs> but to everybody else, had it. It was, it was long. We preserve our heritage, yeah. keep the parklands, fix Rome Road. It was a fundamental platform for most of the speech nights that I went to. Rome Road was a topic. Um, for so many people to say, no, it wasn't mine. Well, I wasn't saying that at the time. Um, the Lord Mayor promised to fix it. That's halfway through the council term. This council, and I've defended it and defended it, the glacial pace that we go through, that we proceed at, is we have consulted the public, we've consulted the industry leaders, we've got the results here. We're now going out to consult other, other people. That is the fair consultation. Now, while it's lovely that people feel so passionate about something, they come to our meeting, but that's not consultation. That's listening to five people with strong views who have emailed us and we've got their views already. We now want to go to a proper consultation to the, to the average bike rider who um, I have three in my family who do not agree with what these people have said, but they will have a chance then to, to put their views up and say why they actually avoid front road at this time under the current configuration. I'm sick and tired of being, of being shouted down by very vocal, unrepresentative minorities. And I know that won't make you very popular, but I, I'm sick and tired of being threatened and told what's right. The average person does not agree with what we've done in front row. And I do have some sympathy with the tax saying we've spent so much money on it, perhaps you could just fix it up. But we were told that the by taking the tank traps out, the parking lane wasn't wide enough to be a driving way. So then it led to that I would have just taken the flower beds out and made that into a parking, a driving lane, if that was possible, but it's not. Now, we've, we've, I think the staff of the administration has done a very good job. We have to go down and see them on the courts. We pick the one we like, which is option one. They're going to have to skinny it up financially, big time. And that, uh, in my experience, can always be done. Um, when, it's the, when it's the one that the option that the council has decided upon after consultation. But for goodness sake, I mean, two years just to get to this stage, it's outrageous. And then to have three councillors saying, let's hold it up again. We haven't thought about it enough. A couple of blokes in the audience don't like it. I mean, for crying out loud, you're a council. If you want to be treated like a level of government, make decisions. Because there's some councils that never make decisions. They don't do anything. Let's do something. Councillor Wilkinson, did you want to speak? Uh, yeah, look, um, I, 
My the concern I've raised about option six might actually be a possible option that occurred thing. I'm concerned about going to public consultation on an option that isn't actually properly resolved. So I, I want that somehow dealt with. I need some I need, I need some confirmation from the administration that when when that, that goes to consultation that curb concrete curve will be shown so people can see that that is is the operator otherwise they're being misled as to what option six represents. And then I also um, would like to I would move an amendment that somehow um, doesn't say option one or six, but it is asking the public or the public um, to be able to make comment on you know permutation of, of those. So I, I and, just wonder whether that might I'm not sure that the motion currently yeah. does provide for that unless it was um, yeah I think maybe um, if we can just get some administration comment on that because I think that can probably be taken on notice um, that, that the, the, the consultation will be um, open yeah. and, and be seeking not just comments on the uh, on the options put but to um, to actually be true consultation ask people to put other options as well so it's rather than just go out and say what do you want we're going out with some options and then saying talk, talk to yeah. us about them. So two pigs in the sand and as I said one with a good yeah. idea and one dumb idea but all that oh, choose the very yeah. my view on the tank track I think that's not something we want to be doing anymore right. um, but uh, I think as long as you know the wider streets we could do a wider bike lane in, with a flush thing, and then it can be bitumen painted and can leave the curve. It doesn't have to be the horrendously expensive option. Option one doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to do the curve. You've got enough width where you don't have to do full concrete apron, for example. And I want the public to be able the opportunity to sort of um, you know, say, well, we like this aspect of this, and we like that aspect of that, and why can't we just narrow the garden bit and, and not have those curves, but have a wider garden. A wider, wider um, a bike lane. So we care more about having a wider bike lane than we do have a metre wide bird. So there's not an opportunity to make those sort of inputs, then I'm happy to, to go ahead with the motion. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. We've got an undertaking to that. Councillor Abia? Just got a question for the administration. Is there any reason that uh, Council moves? and endorsed um, in relation to this project there was an item uh, six that requested an overarching traffic and economic analysis between Carrington Street and the River Torrens to look at immediate past impacts possible impact the school impact etc etc um, will that be sort of coming around the same time we need to make a decision or will that be presented as part of public consultation Through the chair, sorry, I was just seeking clarification. That was included in the report last year that presented to Council in October as part of that previous uh, motion to investigate options for Prime Street North and impacts to Prime Street South. Well, didn't take into account the, well, actually, as a matter of fact, it was meant to be delayed because it was awaiting the announcement of the old RAR. And the school, so there was elements there that weren't 100, including the Oban impact and the tram impact that's been put on North Terrace. So there was a bit of body of work that I think still possibly needs to be done to discover new information. So will that, will we still do that through the chair, or we're not going to do that? Will that be part of any process, or uh, through the chair? We uh, we were aware of the Oban project coming up, and that that was obviously going to have impacts on that. There's a whole lot of issues that came through the last year or two in regards to the original Adeline proposal for the light rail and still show frame street. We've kind of dealt with that now that's not in the government's plan and a number of other things. So yes, we can confirm some of those impacts um, as if it comes through the consultation and maybe that's the way we do that. Perhaps we could take on those. That'll be great. The reason I'm asking that is because ultimately, um, as council uh, or this committee would know uh, through the chair is, there's been a number of highlighted projects through the government that have been announced over the last sort of six months to a year that will need to be taken into account in the way of how this will impact on the um, on the bike uh, infrastructure in the city. Um, if you're going to have potentially 1,200 uh, or 1,100 residents 
somewhere occupying the old uh, site. You have the school, you have a tram interchange. We just don't know the level of demand that's going to be applied to this area, so potentially we may need to consider the Adelaide design manual discussion, which we did have a chat also about in council. It wasn't just about creating um, infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure, but also beautifying our streets, potentially in some areas extending or expanding on the footpath and the bike lane uh, to be able to allow for that volume. Uh, we, we don't know if the volume may or may not look like. So potentially most residents that would live in that block or go to the school in that block would want to ride bikes or walk uh, versus driving to commute to the city. Um, so I think we need to take all those things into account in making our decision, especially on the extension path. Look, I've been um, very clear on record um, and in moving previous motions that I am not satisfied um, as a previous council, uh, council that wasn't a previous council, I am not satisfied with the product we've put out to the public and the current bikeway infrastructure. I'm not satisfied at all. I think council can do better, deserves to do better, and our community deserves to do better. I'm not going to accept as a level of government that we would just go, yeah, look, it wasn't the best, we're just going to leave it and move on with our lives. Well, no, that's not what governments do, and that's not what city planners do. We can't simply just leave things. If we can deliver a better outcome for our ratepayers and for our city users, we need to deliver a better outcome. I mean, that's the reality. If it costs 200000 or it costs $3 million or it costs $100 million, these are all things that need to be considered as part of the consultation process, and we will get that through that. Um, at no stage at all, did this council say we are not committed to uh, bikeways that are independent to traffic, that are independent to, uh, to the cars that are driving past, independent to pedestrians. We have been always committed as a council, and this is something that all of us should be proud of. We've always been committed to a separated bikeways. We always have. Not one councillor in this committee or in this chamber over the last two terms of council stood up and said, we don't care for the safety of bike riders and car drivers, none of us have said that. We've all said we want to separate the bike ride. What it looks like is always been the point of debate. The pilot at which was a significant flop around the Dover City uh, discussion was this, was never a permanent solution. It was, it was sold to council while I was here. It was never a permanent solution. It was sold as a pilot, it was sold as a trial, it was sold as a testing project and that's what it was. It is probably a lesson for all of us to learn that when we go out to the community, we install something, we do set a community expectation. And some people are going to like it, some people are not going to like it. And look, I've heard today from the gallery and some people may have been way advanced and they're thinking of where they want to go, but there are also people out there that are still stuck in their own way and look, I know this is Adelaide and people get a bit uncomfortable and flustered around issues, but sometimes we need to wait a little bit so people will catch up in their thinking too. And I think we need to balance that. Also, some of the other things to consider around the tram discussion where someone that was very visionary thought the car was coming, ripped out everything to do with trams and infrastructure around the city. The future car is also coming. It's quiet, it's environmentally friendly, it parks itself, it charges itself, it's going to need road. It is safer than riding a bike and it will avoid bikes. I don't think bikes will be able to avoid future cars, to be honest with you. Those cars have got over 100 cameras and sensors on them. They'll detect any movement and stop to the safety. Potentially pedestrians and bikes can share the road in the future. And these are things we also need to consider as a council. So look, I think going out to the public consultation to hear everything we've already heard, I'm sick of the consultation process. I would like for us to consult on things we don't know, things we haven't researched, to over consult, it's a bit too much and over preparing for our community as well. But nevertheless, if we need to do this one more time for the sake of doing it, we will do it. Uh, but I think it's really important that we're all leave an open mind and we'll try to get as much information as possible. The landscape is changing in our city continuously. There's a lot of growth, but we also need to think a little bit further and we need to think about the future. So I look happy to support uh, what the Lord Mayor has proposed. And I look forward to the consultation process to come back. And I'd ask members of the council to ask their ratepayers, to ask people that are passionate about this, that have been loud, that are for and against or undecided on this issue, to come forth and to put that and present their uh, concerns to the council. Because I would honestly like to bet this and be done and over with it. And we will pick up a template that we could roll out across the whole city because we are serious about bike infrastructure and I'm sick of having council being pointed at and looked at as a 
a, a non-bike friendly city or a non-car friendly city, everyone that wants to come to our city is welcome. You want to walk, you want to catch a drone, and if you, anything you want to do, just come to our city. We're open doors, we want to see you. So um, I'm happy to support this specific question at this stage. Councillor Cameron. Yes, look, I'm not prepared to um, support this substantial motion because I didn't agree with it in the first instance. To me, this is driven by a political guarantee by some people that they would get four lanes of traffic back on Frome Road. And to me, it's not based on data. It's really not based on even, it's not even based on volumes or safety. And it's a knee-jerk reaction to a small section of road. I don't actually like the section of road in terms of aesthetics. I think it's as ugly as, and it's a typical, you know, over-engineered solution. I'm not happy with how it looks, but I'm certainly happy with the fact that it's a wide lane and it provides safety for people, all sorts of cyclists, whether they're beginning cyclists, whether they're families of cyclists, whatever. And really, we've got something happening here that is politically motivated rather than being something that's based on um, evidence. And that's what concerns me. And as far as, you know, not even having something in here about the wider lane, to me says this just smells of a Clayton's consultation. It's just putting up a limited number of options, but really let's not put in the option of the wider paving. And the other thing is, and, and Councillor Abiad has, has even gone ahead and, and explained, there are so many unresolved issues for this north-south bikeway. The new high school is one of them. The potential residential development on the RAH side, as much as we may dislike it. There are so many unresolved issues, and yet we are just putting our head in the sand and just following through with political promises that were made at the last election rather than evidence-based decision-making, and I won't support it. Thanks, Councillor Perryman. Councillor Clark. I'd like to say, ask a real quick question. Um, the narrowest possible scenario, is, is it possible to have that document in, in this paperwork? So when you go out to public consultation, you could have the narrowest possible scenario, which is obviously Frome Street, and what that would look like. Because in here at the moment, what we've got is there is the asphalt part that varies, and then the the other asphalt part on the footpath that varies, or the other other bits are set. So if you can maybe have the narrowest possible piece in there, maybe make it nice and clear in our consultation that what they're looking at, well, it can't be any worse than this. Through the chair, that's exactly what we've done. We've gone on a worst case scenario. Um, so it's worth pointing out <laughs> without entering the debate that um, this is the narrowest possible uh, bikeway. So it could be wider in other parts in the East West Link, for instance. Right. Yeah, I get that. Well, that's good. And it was possible just to mark that on here? Um, certainly we can do that. Well, that's just nice. Okay. I can see what's going to happen. Don't worry. We're, we're looking at an overall picture. This is really, we're arguing. We spent two years of our council arguing. That, uh, 150 metres worth of roads. Thanks, Councillor Palmer. I wish we could do it all again. <laughs> so, um, does anyone else wish to speak to the substantive bill? Can I go back to the Lord Mayor to sum up? Thank you uh, very much, Chair. Um, members, this is not driven by politics, this is driven by a motion of this council uh, from Councillor Moran, which, which won the day. So, uh, also, members, this is driven by partnership, and I, 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 have to, I have to be very, very clear about this. This is driven by a partnership with the state government, just like our laneways project in Adelaide Central Market, the riverbank, is driven by a partnership with the state government, just like the extension of the tram along North Terrace down to the East End is driven by a partnership with the state government. Do we see commonality here, members? We are delivering more in this term of council as a consequence of partnerships, solid, reliable partnerships. And what happens to partnerships when you don't deliver? They fall apart, members. They fall apart. And so does the funding attached to those partnerships. We are taking the burden off 
uh, ratepayers by working collaboratively and in partnership with the state government of South Australia to deliver more. And I personally want to be part of a local government chair who delivers, doesn't postulate forever and doesn't just put it into the spin cycle for three years. I want to deliver. Councillor Antic wants to deliver. Councillor Abiyad wants to deliver. Many of the members in here want to deliver. Everyone, Everyone wants to deliver. Exactly what I'm saying, Councillor Paul. Exactly what I'm saying. We want to be known as the term of council that actually delivers stuff and just doesn't talk endlessly. Ad nauseum. So members, I commend this to you. I thank you for your support. Thank you. Okay, members, can I put the substantive? All those in favour? All those against? Absolutely. Those members voting in favour of the motion, please rise. Uh, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Abiad, Councillor Antic, the Chair, Lord Mayor, Councillor Bashaw, Councillor Moran, Oh, and Councillor Milani. <laughs> and, and before we go down, just one uh, last question. And thank you very much for your help tonight. And, and, and you know, good luck with your broad consultation. Um, uh, how long will the consultation take? Uh, we're planning to come back to Council in March 2017. Okay, so we've got another month. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I declare that carried. I forgot to do that. Um, okay, so that recommendation goes to the council to next week. Okay, that brings us to item eight on our agenda, and that was pulled out by you, Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, look, I, I called it out for Councillor Antic. Thank you. Um, because um, it oh, was. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Martin. And he was uh, he was one of our recent favourite clients. So, Councillor Antic, do you want Councillor Antic uh, yes, to take um, the running on this, or would you like to go ahead? Thank you. Well, look, I, I have a question and um, I will speak. I'm happy for Councillor Antic to begin. Okay, Councillor Antic, do you wish to move an amendment? I'm indebted to Councillor Martin for his jealousy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all. Uh, um, yes, I, mean, look, I actually just wondered if I could um, just start by asking a couple of questions at the start, if I could. Um, and uh, the, the question essentially is, and just to go back a step, this, um, question relates to the original purpose of the motion, which was, um, I think it's in the, in the materials there, that, that, and we are looking at two different, this is only one half of the original motion, the smart mood aspect, we're also still, I understand, looking at the Adelaide Design Manual uh, review as well from the purpose of um, uh, attempting to review those strategies and documents so they don't unnecessarily impede, reduce or bottleneck motor vehicle traffic um, or reduce the number of traffic lanes, etc, etc. So, my, my first question, sorry, sorry for the preview. <laughs> that was more of a monologue. Um, my first uh, question is, I, I presume we are doing the Adelaide Design Manual review as a separate um, exercise. Through chair. Um, that's correct, Councillor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. And also, um, my second part of the question is, I the, the motion was originally the intent of the, and indeed the second motion, which was amended, was to ensure that what we were doing with Smart Move was to um, adopt those principles. Can I seek some assurances from staff that the, the motion, uh, as it is currently put, will does address those those concerns of the original motion? Because it was a, a multifaceted motion in the end. So, but, but specifically the issue of um, motor vehicle traffic and impeding the roadways, etc. Yeah. Uh, through you, Chair, thank you. Um, the short answer would be yes, it is my view that um, the document before you is the interim uh, Smart Move action plan um, pending the development of the broader uh, plan, which is foreshadowed in the strategic plan and also um, in the um, um, 2040 plan. Um, but specifically, the, the areas that, or the gaps, I think, that this addressed and were very clear. Um, in the original uh, resolution of council and then in the engagement process that was conducted independently throughout this review <coughs> was looking at a balanced approach in the delivery of the range of transport modes. So to me that was the primary purpose originally, the full range of transport modes, 
that um, one mode did not have a priority over another. We have a balanced approach there. Then um, the other, another, the second issue was really looking at um, technology and indeed for technological solution. Now it needs to be included at the time of part. Then the third one was looking at partnership and ensuring that um, we we're working with the state and any other key stakeholders where possible. But um, paramount importance in, in response to your specific question, Councillor Anti, is that um, what we're looking at to ensure that we address a balance of transport mode in all that we do and that this not move interim action plan will deal with that. Okay, well, sure. Thank you for those assurances. And I, and I think on the basis of that, I'm, uh, I'm happy to move uh, as printed. Um, and uh, I just want to take the chance to, to thank you. Just, just uh, grab a second. Yes, yeah, sorry. Seconded by Captain Moran. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, the, the, um, the, look the, the, I think this is a very good um, first step in the process. I think we all agree that we, we've come a long way since 2012 when the original Smart Move uh, document was, uh, was uh, first ratified. So, um, Look, it's a, it's a great credit to the team to be able to, to do that. And I think it's a great opportunity to uh, to revise the, the process. And it is an interim step, I accept that. I think that's a, that's a very important um, message to take home out of this. We, we do have now, I think, the first steps towards uh, addressing some of the problems we saw um, tonight with, uh, with Front Street. And I feel with some confidence uh, now that we're getting the pendulum uh, of the new project swinging back towards a nice balanced approach, which of course, means that hopefully we don't see examples of uh, a design such as Rome Street popping up again. So I, I think with those assurances, I'm, I'm very happy to recommend this, this motion to uh, to members and uh, and um, have hope they support it. Councillor Moran, a seconder. Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. I commend Councillor Antic for moving this. Um, the, it was timely, uh, since of course the time that Smart Move was originally written, um, one thing fundamentally changed our city, and that's the advent of new technology. And that was uh, very much uh, uh, one of my, um, uh, uh, I, I voiced that when we were having this discussion before it was time this report was written. So good, in, good to see uh, that this is one. Very closely aligned with our strategic plan in terms of becoming a smart, green, liberal, creative city. That was critically important that all of our strategies marry in with our strategic plan, Chair. Yeah, that's absolutely fundamental. And good to see recognition now of maybe some of the things that Councillor Abia touched upon in the previous debate. But is it a greater recognition, like recognition of the role that transport plays in delivering mixed use transport? So I think this is right on the money, and I absolutely commend our team for a fine piece of work. Well done. Councillor Martin, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a question first uh, of the administration. Um, the document um, uh, suggests uh, if we adopt it as recommended, the strategy uh, uh, will include the expenditure that's detailed in pages 54 to 69 into our integrated business plan. That plan would then include a commitment of $25 million in the next financial year, which is what I added up basically. Um, and so therefore I want to know is, uh, what I want to know is how much of that $25 million is for stuff that's already committed like bikeway projects and how much is that uh, $25 million made up of new projects that have not yet been before council? Yeah, I can tell you that question. Uh, through the chair, the majority of that expenditure is already committed, with and most of that relates to the major transport projects, the North Australian Extension, over City Bikeways. So there's probably about um, an additional two million dollars worth of works of projects. The intent is that if this is endorsed, we'll put these projects up for next year, year into the business planning budget. But there is ability for you to amend those projects and budget as part of that project. So the document's intended to be flexible and adaptable um, to, the, to the timing at that time and the budgeting that's available. Okay, um, uh, look Chair, I, I will say that there are good things about this. Um, it has a commitment to report back to Council every uh, six months and to provide a report uh, every year, which is something we haven't had before. Um, I like also that it does reflect the changes since 2012 when Smart Boost was introduced. Um, and it does balance all of the competing interests. Um, and it notes that there have been significant changes over the last four years. 
it is a bit disconcerting that it anticipates that the next uh, smart move strategy, this is only the interim, 2016 to 18, will be based on the 2040 plan. So that strategy will be based on 22 years hence, whereas we've just reflected that there have been enormous changes over the last four years that have changed the plan. So that's a, a bit of a worry for me. But I'm going to vote against the document, uh, not least because of the finances. I, I would like the opportunity to consider that extra expenditure before it actually ends up in the budget process, which is what will happen if we endorse this. And uh, it does commit us to things that we haven't debated or agreed. For example, it mentions that we support at pages 48 to 50 on attachment A delivering a commercial helicopter to the city. Now, we only ever asked for information. We never said that we'll do this. And, uh, well, I don't believe that we've actually said we will deliver that. We have sort of expressions of interest. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that might be, but that amounts to a commitment to deliver it without seeing the costings, without seeing the nature of what's proposed. And in the same section, we commit to working with the state government and industry to deliver opportunities to uh, support a future drone activity. Uh, and I don't think that's about council features. I, I think it's those things that fly. Um, but I, you know, I'd like to know what that is. We haven't even had that discussion. So do you want to um, seek to amend it or have the discussion? No, no, no. I there's just so much in here. There's a commitment to uh, Bluetooth equipment in traffic lights. We haven't had that discussion. Uh, well, I don't remember that. And, and I want to know anyway, what are Bluetooths? I mean, are they better or worse than, you know, green suits or whatever else is available? Uh, and it also says we jump right into Chrome Street. And you know from what's preceded, I, I can't endorse that either. Um, so let, let's, uh, by all means, provoke with it if you wish, but you acknowledge in doing that that you're approving a whole raft of things which have not been uh, discussed in council. Yeah. Councillor yeah. Colville yeah. and yeah. Councillor Quagga. Yeah. I am going to support this document. I think um, a lot of the great body of work it was needed. Um, I'm a big supporter of the previous uh, or the smart move um, transport movement strategy. And um, I commend Councillor Antic for calling for the review because it was needed. But um, the reason why I moved to um, make some additional inclusions into the review was because I thought that Councillor Antic's motion was too car centric and focused on. Um, car users for the city um, and reviewing the strategy in that light, which is not something that I wanted to support. I wanted to have a more broad, um, all-encompassing review of the strategy, which is what I see before us now. And part of that was to include an implementation plan, which is what I really like about this, that it's an interim action plan. Um, we have now have um, key milestones in place. We're working towards objectives which are transparent for the elected members, for the administration, for the public. We have it attached to budget. Um, we've got a clear roadmap ahead of how we're going to deliver. And that's what I wanted for that strategy. I'm really, really pleased to see that. Um, but also, it's going to include aspects such as um, how we can possibly look at revisiting, reducing the speed limit in the city, which is attached to a number of um, safety enhancements for pedestrians and traffic users overall. Yeah. Um, and also, what a possibility of one way streets. Um, I need to the document. I'm not, um, taxis and how we can make better enhancement features for taxis. I want to include that for Uber. Look at that for Uber and also for tree cycle. What about tree You know, the tricycle oh, Yeah. And also something to consider as well as a, I guess, parking use, parking for small cars, like really small cars. And sort of small cars. <laughs> Chair. Chair. Um, Councillor Clarence, you're next. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, firstly, Gell and his recommendations. Have we really, have we departed significantly from that? Or do you think we could, we're still sort of seen as being aligned with a lot of his recommendations? Through the Chair, um, what we've done is what the Council asked us to do, which is review Smart Move 2012 to 2022, taking into account all those changes that we've talked about down the bottom technological change on the and what's coming. Broadly, it's about balance, and I think that I think this document achieves that. It's obviously, it's in, in your hands. Um, 
In terms of the Gale recommendations, um, per se, I, I couldn't get my couldn't answer that, but the intent of the document is about balance. It really is about balance of liability and city. So is there an inference, I don't know whether you can answer that, that it wasn't balanced before? <laughs> Through the chair, the intent of the original smart city was around transport choices. However, the language is more about prioritising pedestrian, cyclists, and public transport. So, to me, this is the, always the intent is to provide balanced transport and transport choices, which is what the previous strategy intended to do. But the language probably wasn't quite correct in sort of demonstrating that. And just, um, I had a conversation with someone today who said that there's actually um, projected reduction in car ownership globally. Have we got, is that sort of something that we look at as a major trend and, and look at how it's incorporated? Uh, again, through the chair, that is some evidence from overseas. We don't have a lot of evidence of that in Australia yet. Right. But as part of the review that we've done for this interim plan, a lot of things are fed into that. The technological change, cars, cars etc., has fed into that. And I guess with the new transport movement strategy, it will look at all those things. Absolutely. And um, just, I don't know whether someone else on administration <laughs> wants to answer that. But the question about the budget, I would have thought that in terms of the projected budget, that would be something that was reviewed according to our strategic plan for each council and then on an annual basis. So I'll put that as a question to administration. Would you like to answer that? Thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, absolutely, yes, Councillor Carahan. It's like any of our, um, well, the majority of our strategies and the strategic plan, as well as the Smart Move Interim Action Plan, it, it notes projects, however, they're still subject to the rigour of Council's integrated business planning process. So it's actually not set in stone as inferred um, by Councillor Martin. Just referring to um, Tanya's comment earlier, some of the costs in here are connected, things like um, of the bus right. we talked about before, or um, North Terrace and others, but some are subject to the integrated business plan process, the 17, 18, 18, 19. And look, I'm happy to support this. Um, balance, I think, is the correct uh, terminology in terms of expressing the general um, presentation. And uh, my concern would be a return to car century and a singular thought. Um, but this doesn't present that, so I'm very happy to support it. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yes, can I just be um, steer to like, where the document picks up um, what I've spoken to Council a few times before about. There was reference there to uh, maximising capacity of parking in, in the city. But not necessarily that I can see, and I'd, I'd like to express now, about utilisation of on the street parking. So, for example, we go to Sturt Street near this council, you know, there's a site now, there's venture site, and there's all these unutilised car parks. And I had staff members that used to live in the Sturt Street, and they didn't park, they went park down in Halifax Street with a parking the screen and walk three blocks back to their house because. It was all metered parking and it was all so expensive that no one was parking there. It's actually the industry. So, um, how does the question to get the point on, on that? How we price our on street parking to ensure maximum utilisation? Because one of the things that makes Adelaide one of the most liberal cities is the fact that you can actually drive in and park um, within Cooey of where you're going, unlike New York. And other cities, which in my family have lived in, look quite different. Daniel. Through the chair, um, thanks, Councillor. I'll draw your attention under two parking, 2.1 and 2.3. 2.1 is implement the smart city. Um, the smart city parking experience, and there's a number of initiatives under that that look very much at what they're suggesting in terms of utilisation, as well as uh, 2.3 development south for local area traffic and parking management plan, which is identical to the one around.
actually monitored or satellite. So both of those things together will start to under, um, address parking utilisation, uh, loyalty programs, attracting people to the city. So that will cover us looking at reducing compromise with parking. Implementing the smart city parking sprint will address those things and, and a lot more. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this motion or can I revert to Councillor Antic to sum up? Councillor Antic. Oh, look, just very quickly, thank the Chair. Look, once again, um, well done to the team. Um, I think this sort of covers off what we've been trying to do. It's a, it's a really good uh, move forward, I think, in order to get ourselves back into a position where um, we've got a genuinely balanced network. So um, I commend the team um, for the work done and I uh, look forward to the um, subsequent steps and also for a um, similarly good uh, and equitable result of the Adelaide Design Manual in due course. So well done. So can I put the RMA to all those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Item 9, Councillor Martin, City Insights and Supplementary Information. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And look, um, I, I have to say I am moving this with the support of the Chair who is unable to move this. Um, uh, I am proposing uh, a short amendment, and the amendment is uh, first line as is, uh, and then the words defers further consideration of the City Insights project. The first further consideration of the City Insights project, comma, pending the provision of more information about operation productivity gains and cost savings. That reflect um, that discussion. Um, so, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. I'll speak very briefly. Um, look, I've attended two workshops since this matter came before uh, committee, um, uh, along with the uh, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Bershaw, in total, I think about three and a half hours uh, of briefings. Uh, and the presentations, I've got to say, were really impressive. The one we went to yesterday with the flyovers, the 3D, and 2D, and all that, um, were certainly worthwhile. Um, but uh, in the end, the borrowings required $900,000 uh, would the administration says bring a million dollars of new business to the city and save $23,000 a year in costs over its five year life. Um, uh, and I have to say that the information within here doesn't convince me that that's a worthwhile investment. That's not to say that with further information I won't be convinced because I could. Uh, and so it was also with the University uh, Pulse map, um, borrowing some $200,000, uh, product, uh, productivity increase of $6,000 a year over five years, an increase in the uh, value of city visitations of $36 million. I'm not sure how we get there, but there might be another way of uh, dealing with that. And did over the city dashboards, borrowing is of $600,000, productivity gains of $36,000 over five years, and the assumption that we're going to get out of that, that's the city dashboard, um, $1 million a year in extra rates. Now, I don't say that that's all of the calculation, but it's not all in the documents. And I would really like uh, uh, for the opportunity for the administration to take this away again, rework it, and bring it back to us in a way in which I can support it. And so uh, I would therefore ask that everyone just endorse this opportunity for it to be resubmitted. Uh, clearly, that would have to be with the new year. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Malani. Thank you. Um, it's no uh, shock to anyone that I'm a massive advocate for the city council, the city scorecard, and the council scorecard. Um, and I uh, don't um, have a problem with us delving more into getting information. I guess got some feedback and a question. I guess when we look at benefits, um, you know, that when it talks about more connected and informed communities, I guess we, you're asking about specifically what does that look like and how we demonstrate those benefits. But in terms of the city scorecard and the council scorecard, this I'm gathering is recommending almost to build 
a, a, our own system versus getting something that's already in existence. Can I just get some clarity on, I mean, other cities have um, city scorecards. Um, can, we, can you just give me some insight into how we compared to what they're doing and why we've chosen to operate something totally unique for Adelaide? Uh, good chair. Um, what we're looking at doing is leveraging the platforms that we've already built in the previous financial year and using that as a way of then displaying for us our, our, our dashboards. Um, so we've already invested a significant amount of money last financial year and as well leveraging that investment and providing that to the public. Um, in regards to other councils uh, across across Australia, they use one of two methods. One is either leveraging platforms as well or they look at offering a system. Uh, typically those systems are still standalone individual systems that aren't integrated. Um, and they're running a similar problem that we faced in fact previously, which is around more time and inefficiency in updating those the data that we use. So it's about integration, number one, is that what you're saying? Correct. Um, and the Building on what we already have, can you just expand on that? What what have we got? What can't we like? What's the barrier to enhancing it? Um, and because I I want to take this to the public and get that engagement, um, can you just explain to me that that gap further? Yeah, sure. Uh, through the chair, last financial year we built on. Um, three main platforms. One is the data management platform, which is basically a, a way for us to centralize the data. Uh, so it's a centralized data repository. Um, so that was the investment we did last year. The other investment that we've done is around integration. So about getting our systems to talk to each other. Uh, and then the third, um, which was our CRM and the City Pulse platform, which is a, uh, a way of delivering information to the public around City Works, but then also other things like development applications, permits, and as we do along. Um, what's missing right now is two main things. One is our internal data capturing of progress against uh, strategic plan actions. Um, currently, it's all a very manual process through Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and, and other ways like that, so we're not using the system to capture that. And then the other one is actually then leveraging what we build uh, on the data management platform, making that public and available. So we've got the ability to create um, the dashboards and the, and, and the get you know, the, the gauges. It's now about making that publicly accessible instead of accessing an internal only. So I actually, um, in terms of the city progress dashboard, support this very much. What, I, what I'm hearing is that we've done a significant amount of work on collating all our data, we've done some significant amount of work around disparate systems being integrated um, and including a CRM etc. And now what we want to do is take that uh, and overlay that, we've got our strategic plan, we want to take all that data that's been fed into this big machine and we want to put it up there and say this is how we're tracking against everything in our strategic plan and our corporate plan as well. I think this is a very important piece of work and I can understand that it's not an off-the-shelf solution that we need to develop this um, in-house. Um, just, just clarifying, I've got that sort of overview in layman's terms correct. Um, I believe people we should get on and do this piece of work. We have a strategic plan we must, must, must remove manual processes and showcase how we are tracking against our strategy. This is a crucial piece of work. I don't think there is another pathway to doing this piece of work. Um, I have some faith in this document. Um, so I'm, I'm open to having some other questions about the other two projects, but in terms of three members, I really would like to get on and do that. Um, in fact, I'll put it, I'm happy to put it as an amendment up to that effect. Do you want to do that now? Yeah. So, um, the, third, the third one or two for further consideration as Council might like to do, go ahead with three. Fair consideration of, um, so we'll need the, no, sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just amending the, uh, 
that one paragraph. So I can't ignore that previous paragraph, but um, this relates to um, the uh, recommendation relates to three city insights projects and um, what Councillor Milani is suggesting is that we defer for um, City Insights Projects 1 and 2. So if you go down a bit further, City Insights Projects 1 and 2. Is that right, Councillor Milani? Well, I'll um, know that. Um, yeah, 1 and 2 for those who want to get information. I don't um, deny anyone further information. And proceed with City Insights yeah. number 3. Yeah, 600,000, which I think is correct. Very good. So um, we've got the we captured your amendment accurately, Councillor Milani. Yep. Then I seek a seconder for that. Seconder by Councillor Marion. So now Councillor Milani is Go ahead, Councillor Milani. Well, I've already highlighted why okay. this is this is not something you can buy off the shelf, in my opinion, and as um, outlined in the report. Councillor Clarehan, uh, second of the of the amendment. Look, I I agree with Councillor Milani on this one. I think it's very much something that we need to move forward on. Lots of other organisations are doing exactly this. For our organisation, given its diverse business, it's, it is incredibly complex, uh, more so than any other I could imagine. Uh, and I, I think we need to acknowledge that the technology is there to improve our productivity uh, and we need to keep moving on forward on that one, otherwise we're going to get left way behind and that will cost the organisation over a longer period of time. Councillor Martin. Yes, look, I will speak against this. I, I, I don't uh, disagree that this is a good direction in which to move. What this argument turns on is that we are proposing to borrow in the instance of the city progress dashboards $600,000. It is not part of our operational expenditure. We are going to the bank manager and saying give us $600,000 for a software program that will um, uh, uh, supplant a program uh, that is no longer used, um, which we didn't like but which we can provide the information to you now in a form that's digestible for $9,000 a year. And by the way, the $600,000 will have, that is the software it purchases, a useful life of five years. Now, the administration has said to us in the paperwork, the operational productivity gain is $36,000 over those five years. And additionally, it bases the principal benefit on an assumption that we will get a million dollars in extra rates as a consequence. No, I can't see the connection. I, I would be happy to approve this if I could be given the information that would allow me to see the connection between the city dashboards and a million dollars extra in rates. Otherwise, for me, it is simply an argument about spending or borrowing $600,000 and probably around 4% um, for the sake of a system that will save us very, very little. Um, in other circumstances, presented with a compelling business case, then I think, yeah, this is, this is a great idea. We should move forward. But as an elected member, trying to explain to an ordinary ratepayer in North Adelaide that we've saved them $36,000 by borrowing $600,000 I really don't have the tools with which to argue that. And that's why I'm proposing we should be asking the administration to go back and come back with the information that makes it a compelling argument, that makes it something that I can explain easily to the ratepayers of Adelaide. Now, I have heard all of the arguments. I, I understand about the interfaces. I've had three and a half hours of briefings. I understand fundamentally what this is all about. I get it, I get it. It's just that the argument that's here isn't sufficiently compelling to allow me to make a responsible decision. 
That's all I'm saying. And therefore, uh, I can't support that amendment to the amendment. Uh, it, it would seem to me a much more reasonable uh, step to ask for that information to be supplied. Anybody else wish to speak to the amendment? Otherwise, I'm going to seek leave to ask for evidence. Um, thank you very much. Just wanted to ask: Is there any opportunity to be able to um, sort of utilise our information, data tables, etc., to allow some third-party facing to, or is this all sort of private information, or what's what's sort of involved? Because I know there's a lot of um, work being done internationally with governments around uh, open data packets where community can create new places. Is this something that we can sort of work with or what's your thoughts on that? Um, so we are actively um, supporting open data. So we've counseled previously as past an open data principle. So we've got 72 data sets currently available uh, on data.sa.gov.au. Our principle is when we build on a data management platform that is an open platform. So we can integrate and we can publish more data from there to the open data platform and then integrate with third parties and open source solutions. Um, probably question a little bit around how flexible those open data solutions are in delivering a relatively complex strategic plan uh, and the way that we operate. We, we have to have an investigation of open source tools or anything like that. Is there like an opportunity to engage, um, you know, sort of the startup entrepreneurial community to do something with this instead of going out to, I know it's a complex exercise, then to go out to the corporate markets, which they end up engaging the startup entrepreneurs and bring them on board and sort of thing. Is there like a community benefit thing that we could do with it? Yeah, we can definitely take that on notice and, and look at that as an option. Um, and take a, maybe a small portion of that in yeah, the trial. Sure. Absolutely. So are we at this stage now where you would say most of our tables inside the organisations and data packets are organised up and then the UI is not quite there or where are we exactly? Uh, through the chair, we're not, right, we're not there yet. Um, we started on that process which the data management platform actually allows us to capture the and normalise that data table so that we can use it. We're not fully integrated with all of our systems at the moment. That's why we're doing some of these projects is to get them integrated. Once they're fully integrated, then yes, that's totally possible. But we're just not there. Right, thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? Or can I um, seek leave of the meeting just to make some comments? And um, I um, thank you. I I also attended some briefings on this, and I, I won't support the amendment, and um, because I think we do need some additional information. And um, uh, at the um, second briefing that I attended, um, I asked a number of questions which I don't think um, were fully answered. And um, and as part of that discussion, administration suggested that maybe the best thing to do is to, uh, to give them an opportunity to, to present some more fulsome information to us. Um, and so uh, I absolutely support the amendment to enable that more fulsome information to come back. There's a lot of dough being spent here. And um, I think for those of us who don't, it's not that we don't understand the intent or support the intent. We're just not thoroughly convinced that this is the that this is the only option. And until we really understand what it is we're signing up to and why, most particularly why we're signing up to this option as opposed to other options, for me that further information is the fundamental before I can actually um, uh, sign off on it. But uh, that takes us back to cut from the line to sum up. Yes, look, uh, members, I urge you to support this. This is about being, um, um, uh, this is about making decisions, as Councillor Miranda alluded to earlier. This is about leaving a legacy on this council, about how we tell the story on how we're tracking against the things that we've all agreed to deliver. This is about transparency. This is so Councillor Martin and Councillor Miranda and everyone else can tell the community, we've promised to do this, and this is how we're delivering it might be that we're not delivering it and there's some questions as to why. So this is about, this is as transparent as you can get in this council about taking something to the public that says how we are achieving our goals or not. So I urge you to support this. It's not something you can buy off the shelf. This is something that has to be customised and developed for us. It might have to require ongoing um, amendments and, and as, as change, but fundamentally I see this as a legacy we will leave for reporting about how this council tracks in the future. It is, it is not something you can say, we build it and it saves this much money. It's very difficult 
in this particular scenario, there are other projects where we can do that, but with this particular project, it's going to always be very difficult to say it demonstrates this or brings in this or saves that. This is about governance. This is about tracking our achievements and showing where we're delivering at a council level and a city level. You want to know how we're tracking against residential population growth? This will show you. You want to know how we're tracking against other key strategic objectives in our strategic plan? This will show you. You want to know how council as a corporation is tracking against what the parameters we've set? This will show you. This is good governance. We should have had this in place many, many, many years ago. So this is the time, people. Let's get on with it. It is not an off-the-shelf solution. This is customised for the City of Adelaide. It will enable you to have conversations with the community like you've never had before. Please get on board this and let's get it um, up and running and make it um, as soon as possible. And I do hope we, cities from around the world, look at us for this type of work. So can I put the amendment, all those in favour of the amendment? All those against? You got that? Sorry, it's your call. Oh, oh, sorry, let me do it again. All those in favour? Sorry, I thought you were panicking. All those against? So the amendment is carried. Uh, that becomes a substantive. Does anyone wish to speak to it? No. Councillor uh, Lord Thank you, I will chair. Um, noting that, of course, the two other items, being the city activity monitoring and the 3D simulation model, will come back to us. Can I just ask a question through administration? I apologise if it was asked before, Chair. Uh, Sandra, when will those two other matters come back to us for further examination? Uh, to the chair, and we're looking in February, the session in February, to do that. Okay. Um, I, uh, I members, I commend you on uh, taking a good, close look at any matter on which we're borrowing for. Um, I, I know, of course, that this would have been, I would imagine, the CEO, part of the overall approved borrowing package for the 16-17 year, and as per um, uh, uh, endorsement of that, these projects be brought back to us on an item by item basis, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, but I must say, I do look forward to um, asking a lot of questions about the city activity monitoring uh, product and I, uh, with regards to the two and 3D simulation, um, I'm personally not sure if that's a priority, I must say, for the 16 17 financial year. And when that does come back to us for the debate in February, I might be suggesting that that's something we could consider the, the 17 18 financial year. And I'd like to have discussions for that one. I don't see that as being business critical. That's why I say that, Chair. Councillor Visual. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm actually supportive of the project, it's just I don't have the information that I believe I need to make a decision on it in terms of, because I, I do actually think that the, uh, the cost benefit analysis is pretty, uh, um, uh, I can see that we can make a saving of $36,000 and that's about it and I think the rest of it is, is amber claim. Um, I just want to know from the CEO, is this the, do you believe that this is the best option that we need for council reporting? There were systems in place previously. My understanding is that they are no longer able to be used or they're, they're out of date or whatever, but I, I'd like to hear from you as to whether you think this is the best option. Through the Chair, it's my experience that this is a problem that every council faces, reporting on the deliverables and the outcomes of the strategic plan. I've not seen any council do this very, very well. And in my view, it's a product that we absolutely need. It's, it's something that we need to be accountable to our community. And to me, it's a cost of doing business properly. And I actually also believe that we can lead the nation in how we report. And I know that it's uncomfortable to borrow. And I know that it's not very clear in the business case. But the fact is, we need a product like this to be accountable, and we need to be we need to be reporting in a very transparent way. So, um, I believe it's a product we absolutely need as, a, as an operational tool. So, and so my second question is: so, essentially, there is no other capital city council that has a reporting system that we could 
adopt um, rather than create our own because, you know, and, and I totally agree that we need a reporting system. I guess what I'm querying is, first of all, the benefits of the reporting system as it's reported in here. I, I would much rather the case state, this is what we need for transparent reporting and it's going to save us $36,000 over five years as opposed to sort of the, the returns, which are, I think, a big value. But it's sort of more that really what we're saying is that nowhere in the world is there a reporting system that we could adopt or um, use. So the Chair, I know there are off-the-shelf products that can be um, adapted for use. Yeah. The value of that is, is questionable, but maybe someone might answer more. Uh, through the Chair, yes, there are off-the-shelf. So previously, uh, we had a product called Interplan. Uh, Interplan has been used by other councils quite a lot. Um, the, and we've invested approximately $350,000 in that product when we first initially labeled it out. We've stopped using it in Interplan for over two years now, um, and basically have lost the right to use. So we'd have to repurchase Interplan if we were to use that. Um, from a reporting and capability perspective, there's probably not a lot of councils in Australia that are wanting to report publicly through a public dashboard. They typically use it from quarterly annual reporting perspective. And once again, it's not an integrated solution. So when we try to integrate Interplan with our finance system and our HR system and our project system, the cost of doing that was substantial. And every time we change our strategic plan or change our annual business plan budget, we have to go back to the vendor to keep changing it. So it was not a very sustainable way of doing it. The approach that we're taking right now is a much more stable, sustainable way and we actually have internal resources that can do that. And sorry, one more, one last question. Um, just about the usable life, useful life being five years. Uh, so that's what we would just use in the business case. So it's typically software have a useful life between five to seven years, but through ongoing maintenance and upgrades, we can extend that life of that product. Captain Maloney. So the, if it's to, if we can develop something that is nation leading, I think was the word anyway. Um, is it possible we could then on sell it? Can we sell it? Through the chair, that's always a possibility. Um, I guess with council as well, we would like to share what we've learned in the IP that we've got with other councils. So it could be, I guess, a decision of council to see if we create that IP and sell it or do we provide that as a service to the councils? Um, Councillor Farron. Yeah. Look, um, Councillor Mark Malani referred to you know, the ability to integrate and being able oh, to. I beg your pardon, Councillor Clarahan. Apparently, he seconded the amendment and therefore. I'm not able to speak to the I've been told, I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, does anybody else wish to speak to the substantive? So that takes us back to um, Councillor Martin to sum up. So can I put the substantive, all those in favour? All those against? Oh, sorry. Okay, let's do it again. All those in favour of the substantive? All those against? That's carried. Thank you. That brings us to item 10, which is uh, again um, Councillor Martin exploring Centre for Food Culture. Uh, look, very briefly, um, Chair, I I'm just uncertain as to what the administration is hoping to achieve. Um, it says that 24. Can I just uh, stop you for a moment? Yep. Um, perhaps somebody would like to move it to get us started. Moved by Councillor Malani. Can I get a second there? Um, seconded by Councillor Corbell. Councillor Malani and, Co and Councillor Corbell, you're happy to turn Councillor Martin? Okay. I, I, I'm exploring whether um, I want to move an amendment or a, a change. At 24.1, the administration uh, provides a, a list of uh, options. Uh, at the top of the list is to consider, we're invited to consider noting this report and allowing it to lay on the table. If we adopt the motion, as recommended, will that be the outcome or do I have to move that as a separate amendment? So who'd like to speak to that? Councillor Martin. 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 Councillor Martin.
Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, the question. Yeah, um, sure. I think I might be able to answer that to your or Judy's answer. I, that, that would be an amendment to this. Okay, Sorry, well, you... I'll do that as an amendment. That uh, the discussion paper on the Centre for Food Culture be noted and that no further proactive measures be taken. So, um, so you're keeping paragraph one and changing paragraph two to read that no further. Yep. Uh, uh, um, notes. Recommends council recommends that the discussion council. paper on the Centre for Food for Food Culture be noted and that no further proactive measures be taken. At this stage. Uh, well, proactive means actually pursuing it. Um, uh, the paper makes clear that we're always open to options. Yes. Yes. We're just trying to get that down, Councillor Martin, that no further proactive measures be taken. Is that it? Yeah. So I need a seconder for Councillor Martin, a seconder by Councillor um, Moran. Councillor Martin, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, look, thank you, Chair. I, I don't know where this came from. I suspect somewhere in Council there's a suggestion box with. No. Paper. I might be able to help you get Oh, good, okay. Um, we did a uh, consultation for the market district area, for the market district, and this was one of the suggestions that arose from the market district. So it's a community suggestion that okay. was um, picked up in that in that process. Okay, well, look, uh, I went uh, uh, following an invitation to uh, one of the meetings at which the consultative group discussed what the National Food Centre uh, would look like. And I think it is fair to say that it may have been the hour or perhaps the copy of the croissants, but there was a degree of disagreement. Indeed, it was pretty hard for most people to pin down what a food culture centre looked like, whether it should be in a building, whether it should be behind glass, whether it should be at the central market, whether it should be across the road, or even perhaps in some other part of the city. Um, and uh, frankly, I, I thought that um, without the driver that's referred to, um, that is an entrepreneur coming along, because the paper makes it clear that we're not going to come up with the dough for this, it has to come through a partnership. Without that, there is no point in having the discussion. Uh, we are not in the business of creating um, national food centres, uh, national gem appreciation societies, uh, National Food Polishing Associations, they are outside of our remit. But it's perfectly reasonable if an entrepreneur comes along with a great idea that would complement the activity in the central markets that we might view it favourably and take some further action. But this paper, as you'll see from um, the 20 pages, numbered 78 to 98, um, comes up with um, the view that it, whatever it is, doesn't really exist at the moment. Uh, and I took it to mean that 24.1, um, in terms of council's potential options uh, or potential role, the following options are available. Note the discussion paper and lay it on the table for external partners to pick up. Now that's at the top of the council uh, administration's recommendation. And certainly the information that's being provided here would lead me to agree. So. <laughs> so I would simply suggest to you that the administration is uh, apparently sending us a clear message. Um, there is no conclusion in here. There is nothing to support other than to make a recommendation that we go out and find somebody to assist us to do this. And uh, as I suggested, we're not in the business of that. I think we leave it on the table. <laughs> And we allow others to bring it uh, to us if they wish. Councillor Moran, a seconder. Councillor Malani. Thank you. Members, I urge you to uh, vote against Councillor No Martin's um, no. Um, I actually like we do have a suggestion box. I hope we have lots of them dotted all throughout the city. We are in the business of. Um, generating ideas, being an enabler. Councillor Moran and, I sh and, and many of you share an ambition where we discover what revenue generating businesses we can support and partner with and be a part of. Who, who's to say this couldn't be one of them? There might be different views on details. We're not talking about details here. We're talking about a concept. We're talking about a business case. We're talking about a, um, um, an, an idea that needs more, more uh, 
thought and, and uh, development. But when are we in the business of saying no to ideas? That's not the council I want to be a part of. Let's uh, look at these ideas. Potentially, this could be the U Park of the future that funds, funds council. This could be one of them. We don't know yet. So why say no so early in the piece? Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I speak against what's before us here? I agree with Councillor Malani. I think we need to keep the door open. Because, Chair, for one very good reason, um, we are, in future years, embarking upon the redevelopment of the Central Market Arcade. And I think we need to have all options on the table in terms of what the mix would look like, our tenants and the tenants potentially of others. So why would we not want to be just proactively out and about? I mean, what perfect location and proximity for something like this? Now, look, at this point in time, this is very conceptual. That's all it needs to be. I think we would acknowledge that. But this might, this might mature over time. I mean, two, three, four, five, six years time, it could be a wonderful opportunity and possibly could be a source of revenue for this council. Uh, it could be a source of revenue for entrepreneurs. We don't know, but why would we close that down at this point in time? So, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, I think Adelaide has a reputation of doing that. Uh, uh, food and what is sitting of some note. And, and our Adelaide Central Market really is, and Buda Street, you know, right there, and right at the hub of both of those aspects of, the, uh, of Adelaide and Australia. And, uh, We've got the National Wine Centre here um, in South Australia. I think most people agree of the, uh, where Adelaide and South, South Australia sits in the, in the wine reputation internationally as well as Australia. And, and I think this is just an opportunity for us to sort of um, you know, uh, build on that um, significant aspect of, of, of Adelaide to see along this lovely bluestone buildings. <laughs> Oh, can we work it into any conversation? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Does anybody else wish to speak to the um, to the amendment? That brings it back to you, Councillor Martin. Oh, Councillor Moran, you've reserved your right. No, cut back to you, Councillor Martin, to sum up on the amendment. Yeah, look, I, I just make the point that. Uh, I, I don't think Councillor Milani understands the paper that's provided. The participants could not come up with a concept. And the recommendation of the administration is that Council indicates its support uh, for the concept by um, approaching uh, or actively looking for potential partners. That is to say, there is no proposal on the table. It requires us to go out and create something about which those who participated in the workshops could not precisely identify as a, a viable or defined project. Now, in those circumstances, I, uh, I can't see the sense in that spending money. Um, I note that there is a suggestion that somehow it's aligned with the Museum of City of Adelaide, um, which Councillor Corbell proposed, and I'm not sure, and perhaps the administration can provide advice, whether it's intended that some of the money that's provided for that would be expended here or whether it's a separate budget. Yeah, that's a question. No, I'm summing up, all right. Um, but in any case, look, it just seems to me that uh, it's just one of those um, ideas that leads to cost and time and just further exacerbates council's bottom line, which is a substantial deficit. So can I put the amendment, uh, members, all those in favour of the amendment? All those against? The amendment fails. That takes us back to the substantive motion. Um, and uh, Councillor uh, Councillor um, Mamani, you haven't spoken even initially. Yes. Councillor, oh, sorry. I needed to give a Councillor Corbell an opportunity. No, okay. Thumbs up. Okay. So can I put the substantive? All those in favour? That's carried. Um, that brings us to. See how far we've we got. We're up to um, eleven, and Councillor Bershaw, you pulled this out. Works compound license consultation with New City High School.
Thank you, Julie Chair. Uh, look, I actually pulled this out simply so that I had a moment to read it because it was a late distribution oh. and I hadn't had a chance to read it. So mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to move that. Moved as printed, seconded by Councillor Morani. Do we want a discussion on this topic or can we put it? Let's put it. Okay, all those in favour? All those against, that's carried. Um, we've already carried item 12, item 13, Lord Mayor, of adding value to the night time appointment. Thank you, Chair. In the interest of my fellow members' time, I will also be very quick. Um, Moving as printed. Moving as printed. Seconded by Councillor Lani. Thank you, members. Um, quantifies the evening economy at a uh, billion and seventy-three uh, million dollars uh, per annum. Quantifies employment in terms of the nighttime economy of ten thousand five hundred forty-eight employees. Acknowledges that seventy-four small licensed venues and uh, Adelaide Oval and many other issues are contributing to the growth. Also acknowledges that in our strategic plan, there's no specific reference at all. Differentiating between the daytime economy and the nighttime economy. I just want to be we have a bit of a missed opportunity there. But um, nonetheless, I'm just foreshadowing, um, Chair, I think this is something I'll be bring back in early 2017. I think this is a very good informing report, and I appreciate the mention that imagination. administration <laughs> for uh, compiling it. Thank you. So I'm going to reserve Councillor Milani's right while she leaves the room. Anybody else wish to speak? Uh, I'm only going to reserve it briefly if she's not back in time, and that's it. Well, I just want to thank the administration for the proposal that we explore with the state government night courts as a way of stimulating our nighttime economy. I can see that as a promotional opportunity. You know, plead guilty, see the city at night, court the duck, plead guilty. I mean, you know, it's just endless possibilities. And, and I think that having that influx of people accused of criminal offences at night will be too much for the city. Thank you, Councillor Martin, for your blended contribution. Um, anybody else wish to speak to this, or can I put it? It's just for noting, so all those in favour, all those against, that's carried. Um, Councillor Martin, out of session information papers to note, notice of engagement in research activities, notification regarding alteration of on street parking. Yes, look, um, thank you, Chair. I wish, I wish to ask, and I'm not sure whether uh, it requires any action. Um, and perhaps the administration can provide, provide guidance. Um, Councillor Martin, before you ask your question, I wonder if I could get someone to move as printed and someone to second it. Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Malani. Please go ahead, Councillor. Um, there is a report that's provided in relation to a raft of parking changes in North Ward, um, and uh, they are proposed to be implemented with changes to street signs and the like. In the midst of the consultation process, which we are now going through the local area traffic management plan. And uh, while I don't wish to speak against the changes, the changes may be the best possible parking changes that have ever been presented to Council since I've been here. It is just that we are engaged in a consultation with questionnaires that have been distributed to locals and which say specifically, what would you like to change in regard to parking in your streets? And as uh, the ink is barely dry on those questionnaires, our staff will be out there whacking up new signs saying no parking. And so there is a risk in my view that we could uh, uh, bring some discredit to the process, which by the way, uh, has been enormously successful. I'm informed that we've had something in the order of 1,100, 1,200 responses, which is a record for anything of this nature. But uh, my intention is simply to say, look, let, let's not confuse the residents who would say, wait a minute, I, you, I just put that in, you're already changing things. Can we just defer? And the, the, the deferment of those changes that are proposed would not be for a long period. The information is being collated at this time as we speak. And I have been informed today that early next year there will be a series of recommendations to come to Council which would, might reasonably uh, include these changes. I add one. Uh, can, I, can I get an answer to, for that? Chair, yeah, just yeah, are we just noting an out of the session paper? Yeah, yeah. Can't uh, Councillor Martin do something uh, other business on this? Um, I think what Councillor Martin is trying to work out is whether if we just simply note this, and bear in mind he is entitled to move something else. 
um, that uh, whether the changes will come about straight away or whether they can just take on notice that it might be sensible to defer them given that it's other consultation taking place. I think right. it's simple. The, chair, the agenda item is just nudging it out of section paper. That's, right. that's it. Right. It's not, it's not specific. He's, he's entitled change. to he's entitled We can't to change the paper. We no, just he's entitled to change the paper. I, I, no. I'm advised he's entitled to change it, Councillor Malani. So I'm going to give him the opportunity to ask his question and have it an answered because I think the answer is probably yes. I think it's very simple. So can I hand to whoever might be able to answer that? Um, through the presiding member, um, I think Beth can talk to the timing of the local area traffic management plan. Um, we are aware of the consultation, and um, these requests uh, do often come from residents or users in these areas. Um, and sometimes they're driven by us to what we call tidy up Earth Street to make it consistent and to address um, car parts which sometimes would be illegal because they're not the right size. Um, in terms of the ability of the local area traffic management plan to address this level of on street bike time controls, I'd need Beth to, um, to help me with that. Can we take a note of it? Because it's about the interaction of two different processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should take a note. Chair, certainly as Councillor Martin has, has talked about um, in a detailed engagement process, but I prefer to take a note mm. and, and Claire and I can discuss and, and bring it back. I'm happy with that. Mm. Thank okay, thank you. And um, so, members, um, would that issue dealt with? Are we happy just to move it? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Um, any other business? We've got a motion on notice from Councillor Corbell. In other business. Um, motion on notice in relation to cigarette butts in their public room. So moved by, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you. I am in the interest of, this has been a three hour plus meeting already, I'm not going to speak too long. Um, really, I'm just shocked to be collective and pass it over. I just want to talk briefly about the intent. Um, in early next year, state governments, local government is going to have more control around local use of the litter. And um, council has a role to play. Cigarette butts are choked on your waterway, they're toxic. Um, if you put a cigarette butt in a glass of water for one hour, it's going to turn brown and it's, it's full of toxic chemicals like arsenic and lead and cadmium. And about 50% of the rubbish that's in roadways is cigarette, um, in waterways is cigarette butts. So there's things that we could be doing, like handing out personal ashtrays. You know, at the moment, if, if you take a dog for a walk in the parklands or anywhere really, you are supposed to be carrying with you a doggy food bag, which council provides for free of charge. And they can be, if dog owners can be issued with fines if, if they don't carry one of these bags. And if it so happens that the dog poop is flushed down the waterways, the worst that's going to happen is a slight spike in increase in E. coli. And yet, on a daily basis, we are seeing cigarette butts being put out in the public realm and put out in our planter boxes and being flushed down the waterways. There's things that we can be doing. And in fact, South Australia is one of the worst offenders in the country because we, we are behind. We've stood still in regards to our litter um, and waste management of cigarette butts. So thank you for supporting it. I won't speak any more, um, but yeah, I just wanted to communicate what my intent was, which may include issuing fines and um, utilisation of the Royal Court at that. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. So can I put Councillor Corbell's motion? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Thanks okay. to any other business. Does anybody have any other items of business, Councillor Martin? Yes, I have a, a, a question with a notice for the administration, though the Lord Mayor may wish uh, to comment. As a consequence of a threat by the leader of the Greens and the Legislative Council to consider disallowing the 42-year lease granted by the Adelaide City Council over Park 25, there was a meeting at Parliament House yesterday attended by a council staff, a team of council staff, council lawyer, the Lord Mayor, SACRA officials, APA representatives, and the leader of the Greens. Uh, as I understand it, as a compromise, SACRA and the Lord Mayor on behalf of the elected body agreed to consider a proposal for a raft of changes to be attached to the lease to signature. Could the administration or the Lord Mayor explain the broad detail of the proposed changes and if and when the elected body will have the opportunity to consider them? So, Lord Mayor, 
I'll speak to that chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Martin is correct. Um, uh, but notwithstanding, though, of course, um, the members, as you know, this is regarding to the 42 year lease with uh, Act 25 for SACA. Um, that process has passed through council, passed through APLA, and so forth. Now it rests with the state government because it is the state government's decision, not the government's decision, to um, uh, endorse or otherwise the lease because any lease over a period of 10 years on the parklands, that is the due process for it. Now, I attended that meeting for the purpose of verifying facts. Uh, Mark Parnell, MLC, um, uh, has six points to my recollection, Councillor Martin, of which he has some concern about. Um, Alpha was in the room. Um, I was in the room, Council Administration, and members of the room, and members of APA, Park Lands Preservation Association, also in the room. Uh, what came out of that meeting, members, is that um, uh, I think it's a uh, spirit of intent and interpretation of, uh, of, of lease or license documents. Um, there seemed to be general consensus around that room um, as Mark Cowanell took the group through each of his points of concern. They were mostly matters of interpretation in terms of was the lease prescriptive enough, and the license, prescriptive enough to reflect the spirit of intent as agreed by SACA and Council. So um, I understand the next process um, is that there will be, uh, notwithstanding, I think this matter needs to be concluded by the 1st of December, uh, and uh, the next process is that um, uh, legal, um, legal minds are uh, putting some more prescriptive wording into that lease license agreement. Um, and then Mark Parnell will either take comfort with that or he will not. If he does take comfort with that, there's a process that plays out in Parliament. I might just need some assistance from the administration uh, with that process. Um, can anyone answer that question? I was asking the same question as well. Uh, should um, um, Parnell be satisfied with the um, amendment, amendments to the lease? Um, he will get the today and all the variations. Um, and this is one of the said, um, um, I suppose, try to just further clarity, clarity in terms of detail. Um, he can withdraw his private member's business, um, which is basically to allow the, um, the lease to then be cleared for the parliament. That needs to be done by Friday, because it's um, um, following Friday, um, the parliament is not only sitting, or the matter can't be considered further. So. Um, we're confident that the amendments or the variations are, are minor. They have, as I understand, been put um, to the panel um, today. Um, so we should find out within the next 24 hours whether um, we have got um, comfort from, um, from him that he is happy with the release as very. I just add to that if I can, Chair. And I think quite rightly, my panel's comment was as a. Um, uh, a state government in will see um, that uh, they get one look at this um, and you know, it won't be coming back to Mark Parnell in Mark Parnell's lifetime. So he was uh, he was very open and very transparent and very communicative and I think he chaired the meeting extremely well um, to ensure that once this is endorsed by government um, that all, all parties are happy with it. So I think it was actually quite a constructive outcome and uh, we'll see what plays out in the next segment to our can I uh, just ask for an answer to the part of the, uh, the question, which, which was, given that this represents a variation to the lease that was approved by this council and has, as I understand it, uh, impacts on public access, fencing and the like, is there no opportunity then for this council to have any consideration of that uh, uh, draft of changes or uh, an opportunity to provide comment? So, can we get an answer that? Um, I might hand that to Justin, I think I can assist. Um, the short answer is given the process and the timing, there won't be an opportunity to bring back those variations to Council for consideration. It is before Parliament and Parliament is the final step of the decision making process. What we will provide, however, is the information back to Council in terms of what those variations were. Um, so that's there is full line of sight of the changes that have been made, um, but there's not the opportunity to, for council to have another um, bite of the cherry in terms of the decision making process. I can probably add to that if I can, Justin. I asked exactly the same question that Councillor Martin is asking now. 
I was informed that uh, uh, as a consequence of a council a decision made by this council, the delegated authority has provided to our CEO to make amendments of, oh, sorry, variations of that nature. I don't believe they're substantive in nature. They are variations as opposed to substantive amendments. And um, uh, as Justin said, quite rightly, uh, the matter will come back to us as an FYI, but the CEO has delegated authority to, to do this or play a role in uh, experience. Okay. Councillor Martin, that answer your questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any other business? No. Um, okay, councillors, that brings us to item 17, which is a ex um, no motion to exclude. For 18. Moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Slama. This one. Item 18, and then 19, and then 20. So I need a second. You've got the one inside for 18. Okay, so um, I'll put that for. You know, it is actually. It's a, yeah, it's not this separate. No, no, no. Item 17 is both of them. Both exclusions. Okay, well, apparently, they, we need to do it as two separate ones. So, if I can they put the first. Done every meeting. So, if I can put the first one um, to, ex no, to exclude for item 18, all those in favour? That's carried. And now, can I get perhaps the same two um, people, Councillor Milani, and who, who seconded the last one? Councillor Slama. Um, for item, eight, item 19, can I put that, all those in favour? That's also carried. So that moves us into confidence. So all members of the public and all members of staff not associated with this item, these items.
Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for time. I wouldn't put it on that out. <laughs> so now that the doors are open, I declare the meeting closed. Um, I suggest we take a five minute break, um, break, break um, before we move to the next meeting. Councillor Abbey is not in the room, so I'm going to take that position in the absence.
proceed. Um, I reopened the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting um, scheduled for Tuesday the 22nd of November. Still, it's the 22nd of November, we haven't hit midnight yet. At, uh, reopened at 9.09 p.m. And I would like to uh, acknowledge that the Finance and Business Services Committee is meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that we respect uh, their cultural uh, heritage and connection with the land. We recognise um, and respect the cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with land. We acknowledge their continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Um, we don't have any apologies or leave of absence. Uh, can I have someone move the confirmation of minutes? Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Slammer. I'll put this to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Uh, members, I'd like to note that we had uh, three applications for deputation for a public, a public forum tonight that I declined. Um, and the reason I declined those deputation uh, is because my preference has always been that deputation should be heard at council when decision making is being done, not at committee when councillors uh, are still assessing information and dealing through it. So I've referred those items to council, uh, to the office of the Lord Mayor, um, and the Lord Mayor will have to make a decision where whether he will uh, choose to hear those deputations or not. Uh, so just for the sake of councillors that just entered, um, just on the item in relation to public forums, I've refused uh, three deputations to find them that have been deferred to the Office of Lord Mayor to present at council. Um, and those deputations uh, were relating to, just to let you know, to the item 9 Angus Court um, uh, Ombudsman Review decision that uh, we we're going to discuss. I think there was enough of that, so I've decided to put it towards council. Uh, Councillor, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor Hinder. Um, uh, not in that item, unfortunately. I've just had to sort of state the position of, of the uh, of the committee uh, as a chair. There is no chair's verbal report. I'll move to item six, the so items to adopt, adoption on block. Uh, we have item seven, the 16, 17, quarter one revised forecast. I'd like to... I'd like to pull it out only that I want to remove myself from the room while it's being discussed. Okay, so happy to, uh, happy to have that. No, right. So, Councillor Martin, are you happy to withdraw that? You put your hand up. Uh, no, um, if no one else will, I will. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's fine. So, item eight: the 2016 review of confidentiality orders, July 2003 to December 2015. Item uh, nine: Angus Court. Uh, need to get this right. Chinsworth area. Point three: uh, okay. Ombudsman review. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, item 10, review of Council Capital Works projects. Item 11, first quarter report against the 16-17 integrated business plan and strategic plan 2016 to 2020. Item 12, uh, that's, there's no other business there for a uh, for committee to receive a note in the session papers except for um, a motion on notice to consider. So with that, I'll move uh, items 8, 10 and yeah, I'll ask them to move uh, items 8, 10 and 11, moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Ferrahan. Any debate or discussion on those items? If not, I put that. All those in favour? All those against? Didn't get a show clear of hands, sorry members, just all those in favour? Thank you. All those against, that is carried. Uh, move to item 7, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, if you could just state I your comment. And I'm on board of Thank you. So I'll just wait for the Deputy Lord Mayor to exit the room and have the door closed. <coughs> but we don't have to have the door closed, actually. So. Excellent. So, uh, members, I, uh, we have item seven. And someone move, uh, moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran, would you like to speak? Councillor Martin? Uh, I was uh, proposing a very motion. Um, I thought. I've accepted you as a second of St. Catherine Well, uh, that was my point. I put Councillor Lally put her hand up. Sorry, I got confused, but I called it because Councillor Moran put her hand up first as the mover. Well, it's all right, I can move the amendment at Council. Uh, so did you second it? Because I saw your hand up. No, no, I was trying to correct you. Oh, no problem. So um, moved, uh, moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Malani. Did you want to second it? Thank yeah. you. So, Councillor Moran, you reserve your right. Councillor Lani? Yep. Councillor Martin, pause yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, one quick question. 
if I can go to uh, for the administration slide five, where the CEO is granted fifty thousand dollars for extra staff and travel for the Lord Mayor, is that past or present? That perspective or past? Slide the chair. Yes. That's perspective. Thank you. Okay. Um, chair, I, I wish to propose an amendment of variation to the recommendations. Um, I support the recommendations there, but I wish to insert an 11, um, which says, notes that the settlement for a claim of compensation for Dean Rifle Range received on, yeah. Will be held to offset budget borrowings pending the administration presenting to committee early in twenty seventeen a series of options. For the use of the twenty point six million dollars, comma, including, comma, but not limited to, comma, the purchase of an income producing asset. Seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, Councillor Martin, uh, does that conclude your amendment? It does. Yeah, I've got it Excellent. Do you want to read it again? No, no, I think we've got it. Which is one thing I don't have. Just if you can double check it. Just the, the oh, I can't the see claim. it from here, I'm sorry. I, I'll read it. Notes that the settlement for a claim of compensation to Dean Rifle Range received on November 1st will be held to offset budget oh, borrowings. We've got the rest. Yeah, that's all good. Continue, uh, please, Councillor Martin. Pending the administration presenting to committee early in 2017, a series of options for the use of the $20.6 million, including, but not limited to, the purchase of an income producing asset. Excellent. So, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, okay, look, well, uh, very briefly then, I would just say that. Um, um, some people are a bit unnerved by uh, Council's budgeted borrowings, uh, which are scheduled to peak at $40 million uh, in the life of uh, the current financial year, and which we know will be around $50 million at the uh, 1st of July, unless there is some other action taken in the interim. And so uh, $20.6 million looks like an attractive way to pay that in debt. And uh, I see the attractiveness of that, but it's a bit like, you know, um, dad selling the lawnmower when he was making 50 bucks a week, you know, mowing the, the neighbor's lawns. You're actually selling or disposing of an income producing asset that you never get back. Um, so um, I'd suggest to members that um, there is a history of council having sold assets like the Harris Scarf car park uh, and that money being used, at least in part anyway, for uh, debt reduction. And so uh, I would like to suggest that that's not necessarily the best way to go, that there may be a whole range of options that may produce a better financial outcome. Uh, and I will be advised on the administration about this, but because it is a substantial sum of money and important to ratepayers, then we at least owe the $20.6 million the process to determine whether it should be directed to debt production or one of dozens of other options. I, I think I just had an expression of concern um, of uh, support from Council in the room, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Council. Look, I've, I've chosen to accept the amendment here. I've probably recommended that to be a separate motion um, as an exercise. I'm assuming our administration would have done the offset of the borrowings 
in any instance. But I think your approach in relation to the motion um, of um, looking at bringing a report to purchase uh, income producing asset, I think what we might have um, not, are you still considering noting everything and approving everything on this current motion? Okay, so I'll start talking about that. Uh, yeah, all it does is because it is mentioned on two occasions here that that money is being used at this time mm -hmm. as an interim measure for debt reduction, I'm saying, well, it's also considered the possibility that there are other options and it would be really good for the administration to present us with those options in the new year. Fantastic. So, Councillor Wilkinson, to speak to the amendments. I think uh, Councillor Martin said most of it with the Grand Street car park. We sold that to a considerable sum. You know, I, I wanted to be seen that that was used to maximum benefit of the ratepayers and not just to retire a bit of debt. And debt. that would mean interest rates are on time low and we could get a better return on investments. Uh, assets like our car parks are one of these wide houses in such a sound financial position. Uh, so anyone wish to speak against the amendment, Lord Mayor? Question, Chair. Question, go ahead. Chair, can I ask a question through the administration? Uh, it was spoken to or alluded to in a conversation previously, but the, the um, incoming funds um, that were um, attributed to the settlement, see, uh, have they been used already for the offsetting of debt, or would you be able to confirm that? Um, through the chair, um, based on the current cash position, the um, way we treated them on receiving the funds is they've actually been invested into an interest bearing deposit. Um, essentially, at the moment, they're on two fixed terms, one three months and one at nine months. And I think the split is approximately five and a half ten, and it's approximate money. So, can I ask then the two questions then? Um, I, I presume there are break costs if we were to break the current rate. <laughs> That's the first question. And secondly, is the income generated by the um, uh, deposit amount higher than the uh, cost of the debt that we would otherwise be servicing um, without the offset. Uh, through the chair, uh, the, the break cost would not be a, a fee as such, it would be just a, an amount of uh, a full bond interest, uh, not, a, not a substantial amount. Um, the interest rate we've received on fixed term deposits is actually slightly higher by one or two points. Uh, then our borrowing rate at the present time. So actually a natural arbitrary position. Mm -hmm. So then just to clarify, if we were to retire debt versus the current arrangement, we'd be worse off? Uh, a few dollars. Okay. Okay. Actually only a few dollars. Right. Okay. All right. Are you satisfied with that? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Councillors, be it that there's no other debate, Councillor Martin, to sum up. Uh, summed up. Summed up. So I put that. All those in favour? <coughs> all those against? Uh, Artemis Gary. Members, if I could just have someone assist to me in calling the Deputy Lord Mayor in. Oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, that, was the, yeah, that was the amendment because Councillor Moran moved. So can I have someone, uh, Councillor Moran, who's summed up? So I'll put that all those in favour <laughs> of the substantive. That is passed. So I'll just wait for the Deputy Lord Mayor to come back into the room. <laughs> we'll move on to item 9, Councillor Wilkinson, do you have a motion for us? Thank you, Chair. Um, I have um, gone to see. Uh, I need a motion, Councillor. I'm moving the motion as without being read. Seconded by Councillor Brown. Um, I have been to um, see both of the people that made deputations to Council and have inspected both of the hospitals. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I discussed with um, the least of judge, who was the lady who gave the second deputation seeking for the tree to be removed, uh, the option of putting in a roof barrier. And I pointed out to her that she had uh, a gum tree uh, that was now active root system with a pepper tree closer to our house than, than the actual pepper tree, which could be causing. I did observe a crack of about uh, two or three millimetres in her party wall, 
and that person on the outside of the party board is also concerned about that crack. So that's the essence of their concern. Um, but uh, the engineering is inconclusive about whether that tree is actually is the cause or something. If you read the engineer's report, there's not the at all about that. Um, and um, uh, um, she was quite happy with the idea of having the, the roof barrier. Yeah, it's something that the council would incur the cost of removing the tree, or the council would incur the cost of digging the roof barrier either way. The roof barrier would be just beyond the trip line of the tree, the, uh, the 21 or 2 metres out from the edge of the thing. So they were happy with that um, with that solution. And then the, um, the other, um, Sally and John Gamble, who gave the first deputation to us, who had the three properties on the west, they have the one the closest. Uh, they um, want the tree to be retained and the deputation, and you can understand why they do. Um, and then the person on the other side, uh, closest to the uh, being part of the resolution, is about dealing with the uh, lifting papers, basically, on game. That, that, that issue. Um, uh, I was told that you know, that person was really just concerned about picking up the leaves. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, Councillor uh, Moran, you seconded the motion. Uh, do you wish to speak or do you wish to reserve your right? So. Members, we've had a fair bit of dealing uh, on this item. Is there any questions uh, that we would like to ask administrations? Chair, yeah. 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 I think this matter ultimately comes down to just an assessment of risk. Um, the Kamask <laughs> administration, since our last debate on this matter, has there been any further information which has come to light with regards to council's potential liability associated with this wretched tree? Did you call it wretched? Wretched. Through the chair, no, there has not been any further information that's been approved. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Mayor, do you have any further questions? Any other discussion? I might seek leave to ask one question actually, um, and uh, then the CEO wanted to, uh, to make a quick comment as well. So just through, um, well, there's not really through the chair, through me. Um, just um, <laughs> it's a bit late. Um, just in relation to the the bit that says at council's costs, we're obviously. Um, endorsing that position, do we know what at council cost is? Do we know what that amount is? So obviously we're talking about a... It only says investigate. No, it says a resolution to retain and investigate the installation of yeah. um, at the base well, 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 and replace payments at council cost. Yeah. So just wanted to... Uh, are you Just from my last few council things, is your uh, motion to just investigate and get a report back? Is that what you're intending? No, no, no. I'd like to understand. Well, the wording says investigate. I've spoken to an arborist who told me the cost of the roof there is about $200 a meter. So we don't have that. Sorry, I just wanted to ask that question for clarification. So, see you. Could it change just some technical comment, I think, it would be useful. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, through the chair, uh, just to clarify the uh, management options that have been considered previously um, in regards to roof areas, page three of the FMG engineering report um, states that roof areas are not a viable option at the site due to the close proximity of the tree of the uh, structures and the uh, recommendation that the, uh, the tree protection zone and the st stability zone not be compromised to the installation of roof areas um, as it could uh, compromise the structure of the tree and the health and vigor of the tree. So, um, we certainly, we certainly could undertake some investigation, um, but we do have some evidence to suggest that we're very be difficult to work out. So, Councillor, you're summing up. Um, just any other remarks or questions? Okay. Yeah, that there's none. Councillor Wilkinson, to sign um, I deal with this at work professionally and deal with arborists as well. So, I'm going to get on the floor. I'm the arborists that I deal with. 
we're doing this work all the time. Um, I talk about specific situation. The roof area is actually going to be beyond the canopy of the tree. Normally, when we're building townhouses and things close to pep trees and other such trees, we can actually go within 0.6 of the of the radius. We're actually not 0.6, we're actually beyond the canopy. So, how it could possibly be suggested that um, a, a digging a root barrier <coughs> more than 12 metres away from the trunk of the tree is somehow going to undermine the health or the structure of the tree is beyond me. And I'm quite glad you that that's how it's been reported, to be honest. So, um, it's, that's why I had to make my own kind of investigation with my own professional advisors on, on the thing. Um, so uh, the, uh, it's a good solution. And, and without being a green council, keeping tree canopy and things like that, it's always going to be people who, at the end of the day, they just can't be bothered picking up the leaves. And that's why they want the tree gone. Um, but that's up in the motivation. And, and it's, uh, the, the engineering is inclusive, and the other trees which are closer than this. Root barrier would actually address whichever whichever um, tree roots are affected. If you can chop this tree out, and then you still get it back in the trees, the gum trees are closer to it. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Members, I put this. All those in favour, all those against, that item is carried. Should all go and give the tree a big hug. Um, or the tree should hug us. Uh, moving on to the uh, next item, we're dealing now with um, is there a motion, was a motion on notice from the Deputy Lord Mayor, Article 13. Move those printed. Move those printed. Seconded by Councillor Martin. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. So, unless somebody wants to argue with me, I'm happy to just leave that for you. Fantastic. Sorry. Councillor Martin is a seconder. No. So no again. <laughs> Mr. No. <laughs> Dr. No. <Mayer. laughs> Dr. No. Unlike, unlike Councilman Barney, I know how to say no. Well, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I but I <laughs> so I have a mover in um, the Deputy Lord Mayor and Second Councillor Martin. Both of them have chosen to. Um, I guess reserve the right at this stage if there's no. Does anyone want to speak against this? Councillor Wilkins is speaking against it. If you're not, I don't want you to speak. The administration has actually already done it. Oh, that's great. So we're done. Councillor, Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, come up. I'm oh, sorry. I'm confused here. Who's running the meeting? All right. Councillor, Deputy Lord Mayor, you summing up. Oh, summing up. Summing up. I need to hear that. All those in favour? All those against? That item's carried. Um, is there any other business? Okay, I will move on to item 15. We have a couple of, we have a few items to consider. Not from me. I'd like to second that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's quite operational. Oh, it's a joke. We've moved on. <laughs> Members, please, if I could just have your attention. I know it's 9.30 when I move on. So, uh, item 15, exclusion to the public. We've got three items to consider. If I can have the first one. So, move to exclude. Moved by Councillor Moran. Seconded by Councillor Malani. Any debate? All those in favour? That is carried. To exclude on item 17. If I can have a mover, moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Martin. All those in favour, all those against, that is carried. And again, uh, an exclusion of 5 and 18, quarter one business operation report, 16, 17, September year to date. We're going to have someone move to exclude, moved by Councillor Virtual, seconded by Councillor Sklama. All those in favour, all those against, that is carried. With that, if I could ask any members that are not directly associated with those items of staff or public to please exit the room and thank you for closing the door. And with that, we'll also switch to camera up.
With that, I'll close the meeting at 9 35 p.m. Thank you. Sorry, no, no, no. I'm going to do that. 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 I